So Tony Norris, president of Equal. As we know, COVID is affecting all of us and sometimes things just don't go to plan and we have to learn to adapt. But we got through another masterclass. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this masterclass and um, the changes in government regulations have certainly thrown us a curveball. So what we were doing two weeks ago and how we had planned this masterclass changed midweek last week when we thought we would be going into some type of lockdown. And then all of a sudden we've had to change again last minute on Thursday when the government did announce this lockdown. So what we've done with this masterclass is, you know, different to what we had intended, but the objectives are the same. And that is to deliver to, um, you know, three fantastic presenters who are extremely knowledgeable and extremely well respected and, you know, let them pass on some of their knowledge now, in terms of equal, for those people that might be unfamiliar, uh, it is a new initiative. Education is one of the pillars of the organisation. Um, this is one of the masterclasses in a series. Yeah, so equal stands for Equine Events Australia Limited. So it's a, an abbreviation. But the objectives of equal are basically has two distinct pillars. One is education and equine events, and it could be across anything to do with whatsoever it could be to do with health it could be to do with um, you know access to elite athletes like this master class but the other part of it is that we intend to run events and so obviously with COVID there's a degree of uncertainty and the landscape is forever changing so you know we're a little bit cautious to proceed on the event side but certainly the master class series has, has done extremely well uh, this is the second that we are delivering in the series Unfortunately, we've had to cancel others due to COVID and border closures, and et cetera. So it is a, a difficult environment to set these up and get them going. But the advantage of masterclasses and live streaming is that it does provide us with different avenues and different models on how to deliver these masterclasses to the audience. I think that's, um, that is true. Our education, our knowledge, um, the thirst for knowledge certainly doesn't stop even though COVID is around. Now you talked, um, you said we did have the opportunity to catch up with three very well credentialed people. They were great opportunities to chat. I learned a lot. Um, Dale Plum, uh, obviously synonymous with the show ring, countless champions at all levels, Royals, Nationals, Horse of the Year, as I said uh, in his intro, it's probably not much that Dale hasn't won. Russell Johnston, an, an Olympian in 96 at Atlanta, and uh, Amanda Ross, who competed in the eventing in the 2000 Olympics. Fantastic opportunity. These masterclasses, they really are a wonderful opportunity, aren't they, for people to get to know more about these individuals, but to learn the, their tips and tricks of the trade too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been very fortunate to um, come up with a partnership agreement with the Off the, off the Track program. And so they have supported us today. And then the other part of it is that Baristock has provided us an opportunity to speak to some of their sponsored riders. So they've given us access that we probably wouldn't normally have. And so we're very grateful to both the Off The Track program and to Baristock. Um, but you're right, you know, these people, uh, we've interviewed them today. They're absolutely fantastic. Their knowledge and depth of knowledge is amazing. And, you know, the idea is that you know, you may, you may or you may not agree with what they have to say, but you'll always learn something. And that's what, you know, today's about. Excellent. Well, uh, we'll let the viewers decide for themselves, but uh, an opportunity for them to listen to these three wonderful people. Tony, on behalf of everybody, again, thank you to Equal and to the committee for their wonderful efforts in uh, everything they're putting together. And uh, no doubt plenty more masterclasses and opportunities to learn uh, to come in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeremy. Dale Plum is without question one of, if not the most successful show horse producers and showroom riders we've witnessed here in Australia. Spending a career lasting over 30 years, Dale has continuously and consistently produced the goods across the range of ponies, galloways and hacks with success, with success to the highest level, with countless royal, horse of the year and national champions to his name. There wouldn't be many titles that Dale has yet to claim. Along with the many that Dale has produced himself, many other horses have passed through Dale's hands and they too have understandably gone on to great success in other stables. Dale's ability to see the potential in a horse is second to none and it is with the thoroughbred, particularly the off the track thoroughbred, where Dale has enjoyed the most success. From his early days with the les legend Whispering Jack to more recent showring stars like DP Mayfair and DP Amazing, 
Dale knows just what it takes to turn an ugly duckling into the most gracious of swans. Dale Plum, welcome to today's masterclass. Thank you for having me on. I hope it's uh, going to be insightful. <laughs> well, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, we're in lockdown. First of all, I do want to start. How are you going with lockdown? Is it giving you more chance, more time to spend with the horses and the kids riding? Yeah, well, I, I actually love lockdown because it doesn't really change the life here much other than we don't have to do school pick up and drop off. So I get a lot more. <laughs> out of it. And the kids love it. OK, good, good. So things aren't too bad then, it, it sounds. No, very good, very good. Other than we're preparing for a show whenever. We don't whenever. know when the next yeah. It's a bit painful. Um, Nadal, you have, uh, as I said in the intro, you've enjoyed many years of success, particularly with off-the-track thoroughbreds. Where did it all begin for you, particularly with the thoroughbred? Well, it all started as far as the thoroughbred. I, look, we've, I used to do camp drafting, pony club, show jumping, everything bar showing. And through those younger days, um, we had, or my dad bought horses off the track or were given horses off the track, which um, we, as I say, camp drafted or show jumped or sporting, all those other things, uh, eventing. And then uh, when it came time to getting serious, I was offered a job with Vicky Laurie, or was Ward at the time. Yes. And... Uh, I wasn't interested in showing at all, but she was meant to be the one of the best, and I thought I'll go and give it a go and see how it all works. And uh, so I ventured down to Victoria because I'm originally from New South Wales, and um, that's where I think I lasted three months there, uh, where I thought, well, this seems easy. you just got to get a pretty horse and teach it to do circles. So <laughs> it all started there, thoroughbreds. It was it at that time as well. Did Vicky have predominantly thoroughbreds? Is that kind of your first foray into to the bigger horses with the camp drafting? Were they thoroughbreds as well for you? We we had a, had a couple of thoroughbreds that we camp draft. Uh, one was very very good. Um, and uh, as far as the show horses, I always knew that the thoroughbreds were show horses, but I wasn't really into it. So. Uh, it was there where I thought, oh, this can't be too difficult. I know that sounds blasé, but uh, that's what I thought. You just find a nice horse and uh, teach it to do circle work, as I said. And when I put my mind to it, so I went home to Bega and uh, I was told about a grey horse that was on the track racing. And um, so I went up to Bombala show and this horse had raced on the Wednesday and this was the Friday. The show was on the Fridays or Saturday, actually. So I um, rode my little thoroughbred that I was show jumping at the time up to the race stable to have a look at this horse. And when I got there, the uh, strapper was plaiting him up and I said, oh, what are you doing? She said, I'm bringing him to the show. And I thought, oh, and what I saw there just standing he was he wasn't a beautiful pretty horse um like he had a rug on I, I could only see his head and his neck and i would say he had a handsome head and uh so i said well when you get to the uh, show i'll come and have a look so i actually she rode into the show i as soon as i saw him i ran across and thought shit this is beautiful uh asked her to trot and counter a circle she did that and thinking back now i think how amazing was that like a horse that raced on the wednesday this was the saturday at the local show and I said, look, where's the trainer? She wasn't there. She wasn't coming till lunchtime. I said, um, can you tell, if anyone wants to buy, tell him he's sold or he's not for sale because I want him and so be it. That's what happened. I bought him and uh, then took him on. He was my first official, let's say, hack. So um, what into the showing side of things? Was it just you, you came across this horse and it, it was suited to the show ring? Is that sort of what started it? Yeah. Um, well, I... I mainly did show jumping and I just had this thing that I didn't think I was going to get to the top in that. <laughs> I was <laughs> successful. I didn't think I was going to get to the top and I thought, well, I'll give this a go. Like it seemed easier to me. Um, and when you're looking for a horse, you can sort of, well, in my eyes, I can look at a horse and go, well, this one's going to be good enough to win a royal or it's going to be good enough for an ag show where a show jumper you don't know yes. until you're out there doing it. Yes. And I've had plenty over the years that look good 
and then all of a sudden they realise they don't have to jump so high or they don't have to put so much effort in. And uh, so it was, and as far as a business-wise, with a thoroughbred that looked nice, as far as selling it for show horse, I could sell it without doing much with it for decent money, where with a show jumper, they wouldn't, these days it's different. Well, most people yeah. are looking for warm, but um, I do have a thoroughbred, I've had several thoroughbred or three thoroughbred show jumps, two that I owned and one that I had for a client. Um, I bought for hacks and eventually show jumped and one was WS Scandal. Yes, a great story about that horse. We might touch on that a bit later, yeah. Well, see, she, she as a show jumper in my eyes, had the potential uh, to be with, oh, to be very good. And if she was a show hack and showing that potential, say I would have got $40,000 for her in those days. But I was struggling to get $4,000 for a show jumper. So, but we can go back to Scandal later. We'll go back to Scandal. Yeah, good story on that one. Did you, did, would you say looking back now, is it, um, is it just about finding a pretty horse and getting around in circles? Is the hardest part finding the pretty horse? Uh, yeah, it is. It's definitely hard to find a, a beautiful horse. Like there's plenty of nice horses out there. Um, but when you want to compete at top level and you want the best, they've got to tick all the boxes. Yeah. Well, and that's yeah. hard to find the one that ticks all the boxes. Look, there's not the perfect horse out there. I still haven't found it. Um, but uh, it's got to create the picture and it's got to have the temperament. Yeah. So. Yeah, Let's move on to that the first horse in Whispering Jack. We saw that there as a young age. But tell us more about this horse that you, um, the first one, um, your first horse. Silver Arrow was his racing name. Um, we caught up last weekend at the other masterclass. You told us this horse had an exceptional temperament. As you said earlier, started finished racing on the Wednesday and at the show on a Saturday and was dealing with everything. Yeah, well, he, um, so I was lucky enough to buy him at the show, uh, took him home and, uh, so his first major show for me was Melbourne Sh Melbourne Royal, mm -hmm. uh, which I took him to uh, when I was I was sort of strapping to Vicky Laurie at the time. So I brought him down to Melbourne, and uh, I we went across to Adelaide. I took him over there, like he wasn't competing at the show, but I took him over there because I had no one else to look after him, and we kept him off the grounds. Uh, then we brought him back to Melbourne, so no one. Of, some people maybe knew of me because I was strapping for Vicky Laurie, but no one knew I had a horse and uh, took him to Melbourne and in a snaffle, Bradley won everything. Uh, Sylvie, Sylvie McLaughlin was the judge who I since know now is a very capable, knowledgeable horsewoman. She actually tried to buy him at the show after she'd given him Supreme, but I'd already sold him to Vicky Laurie like three days before. <laughs> so uh, in those days as well, the, the Pony Galloway and Hack went together for a Supreme, something we don't see anymore, but as you said, went all the way. Yeah, and and in a staffle, which is really yeah. unheard of. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm a great believer if they go nice, who cares what bridle they've got on? You're meant to be judging the horse, not the bridle. Yeah. So, but now, look at the photo there of him. What uh, what sort of took your eye? He cuts a nice picture. You said he had a handsome head, not the most prettiest of head. Does he have a good way of going? And of course, the trainability. Yeah, he he uh, he just sat up in front to me. He was a overgrown riding pony. He sat up in front and he was just so smooth across the ground. Like he had three lovely paces. He could never really do a length and trot, but his working trot was lovely. Um, and I would say more of a ground sweeping trot. Um, the action, that's the action he had. He had this magnificent canter, uh, but he just sat up in front and just, it was just easy. Like from day dot, he just went around like that, which uh, in those days, it was rare to find them off the track that were broken in well and had a decent mouth, I found, where he was just, just amazing. Absolutely amazing. So um, there wasn't much to train him. He just naturally knew how to go. So I made the job very, made me look good. <laughs> Which is ideal. Who wouldn't want to do that in the showroom? 
We might but, move on to um, another one of the re recent horses in DP Amazing. I said earlier, you you know, we've had great success over the years. DP Amazing, this horse um, really shone through, didn't he? When we talked last weekend, you showed us the photo on the left and you sort of asked the people, what would you would you have taken this horse home? You did also probably say that it wasn't one of the best photos of the horse, but this horse definitely did. It went on to, to champions at multiple royal shows. It was a grand national champion. Tell us about DP Amazing. Well, uh, with him, I was sent. Oh, I was actually uh, speaking to Melanie Parsons in WA about a mare that she had, because um, Heidi was looking for a, a new hack, and she had a mare, and there's a particular type she likes, and it looked like a nice mare. So we were, we we're just about to buy that one, and I said, "Look, to be honest, I want the best. Have you got anything better?" And she said, "Yeah, well, I've got this one," and she sent some photos, and that was one of the photos on the left, and. Um, there was other photos and I sort of was looking at all the different photos and there was pieces in different photos that I thought, oh, well, that part's nice and this part's nice, but like there wasn't just one photo you went, wow. And then it wasn't until she sent me a little video and that's when I went, wow. And um, Heidi said, get on the plane and fly over there because he, he certainly wasn't a cheap horse. Um, and I went down to near Albany. She lived down near Albany and... Um, I arrived, she got him in out of the paddock, hopped on him. She only walked about well, 20 steps and I thought, yeah, I'm going to have this horse. And then after having a ride on him, he was, say, a little bit similar to Whispering Jack as he, he just went natural. And she'd already named him. He hadn't been to a show, but she'd named him. And I thought, no, I'm changing the name because he was amazing. And uh, <laughs> that's how he got to be amazing because he was amazing to ride. And he, same thing, just the most beautiful temperament. Yeah. So, um, what is it like when you take a horse like DP Amazing, you, you know, you, you find them diamond in the rough and you go on and you, you get to that elusive Royal Champion or a Grand National win? Does it sort of make it all the effort and all of that worth it? What's it like, you know, particularly the thoroughbreds, they, they do have a pass often and, and sometimes the training, you know, they, they haven't been trained or started the, the best way or sometimes you, you're inheriting those issues. What's it like when you get it to a Royal show and you're in a lineup and you're riding out for Champion Hat? Oh, it's it's an amazing feeling to, and that's that's what keeps me going uh keeps me looking um because if you're going to do it you may as well try and do the best you can and have the best uh they all cost the same uh, um so and look I, i've as you'll see later on the slides i've had plenty of horses and uh a lot of good ones but those ones that are at the pointy end of the stick uh, hard to find, hard to come across, as I said, with that tick all the boxes. And uh, it's just, it keeps me looking and searching. And uh, I don't think, you, well, you can't beat a thoroughbred for a show horse. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Uh, Chester Pinnerton was his racing name by Medal of Honour. Uh, is there uh, many sort of do you follow um, the breeding of thoroughbreds when you're looking for them? Is there any particular lines or are you sort of more about? a particular horse regardless of, of what its bloodlines are it's the it's the product that i want um well of course i look like when when i uh, came across uh, whispering jack he was she, he was by no mercy and of course a few sh horses came out then because uh by no mercy because everyone sort of follows and i do the same thing like you sort of see a horse um and you think oh well maybe there's a more a few more out there by that horse but it's not always the case um but and like later on the slides you'll see i don't know maybe there's 30 or 35 horses that we randomly just searched up today um so we couldn't remember them all um and there's not many there by the same sire um mm. there may be two two or three by the same sire and the rest are all different sires and so yeah it's a type i look for they've got to have a beautiful front um i like them to go across the ground nice and even and level and uh i've always find uh you can't make a beautiful neck it's it's either there or it's not you can always build a rump up to make it look good and uh with race horses um sometimes when they're in work uh like the real muscly looking ones that sort of look a little bit quarter horsey i don't think they fatten up into a nice show hack I prefer the uh, light, lighter boned, 
uh, more athletic looking ones uh, with a long front. I always find they come up the best. But if they're a bit chunky in race work, well, they're going to look heavy in the show ring, I think. So that's what I'm saying. Yes. We, we might move on to um, DP Velvet. Talking about uh, size, being Coney, definitely a horse that uh, a lot of show horse people are looking for horses by being Coney. And we've got here DP Velvet. Um, tell us about this horse. Quite the transformation in these two photos. Yeah, well, she, uh, we went over to Whittlesey to a race stable to look at a, another horse. And uh, he wasn't what I wanted. And I asked, could I have a look around the stables? And they said, yes. And I spotted this one in the stable. And I said, well, when that one's finished, can I get that? And they said, oh, yeah. So uh, it was only like a month later that I got her. And she uh, she had a joint, like a little apple joint. Uh, I didn't, so it was only cheap. I didn't uh, ask too much about it because... I thought if she doesn't work out, I could breed from her because that's the other good thing these days. We found out that with thoroughbred mares crossed with riding pony stallions, you can breed a better show horse. Um, so I wasn't concerned about a joint. She, she had, a, again, a beautiful temperament, absolutely beautiful temperament. Um, we took her to a couple of royal shows. She managed to get uh, second in two novices and... I don't know whether she got champion led at one reserve at the other in the lead mare class. And then her joint gave way. Oh, well, she just was a little bit sore in it. So, and instead of um, doing anything about it, I just thought, no, you can have a life breeding foals. So we, we actually got one, uh, two foals out of her. One got to a yearling and uh, got colic and we had to ha have him put down. And the other one we've still got, he looks like he's going to be a beautiful dressage pony. Excellent. Um, With these horses, I said before, you inherit you inherit all of the the kind of the past history. How hard is that? Do you do you often come up with a lot of hurdles like that, or have you been quite lucky or fortunate in that the horses that you have taken on have have you know mostly been sound and given you a good um, sort of successful run with them? Um, look, I as a rule don't get vet checks uh, because I'd rather not know. <laughs> I mean, if <laughs> can't see it uh, and like when you see a horse go across the ground you can normally tell whether there's an unsoundness like if they're not level uh, I think well then maybe if it's really nice you might but I, over the years I think I've got one, one vet check on oh, well, I got a vet check on DP amazing because he was coming from Perth and I paid a lot of money for him and I just wanted a vet check so I could ensure him to come across um, all the others, I haven't worried about it. Uh, bow tendons, I've had lots of horses with bow tendons, um, providing they're not unsightly. And much wood, I've never really had one other than Velvet, but she had an off joint that has broken down. The rest have all gone on, um, never been a problem. So you do get people who, oh, it's good. Well, that's I had an ugly looking boat off the track. I think the thing is, too, with them, it's about, um, like you said earlier, you can't tick every box. So it's getting the, the most boxes, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, you've got. Like it's the overall picture. I look yeah. at the overall picture when it's going and then get it up close then and then have a look at the boxes. Um, and unless there's something very obvious, um, I'll, I'll take it on. Take it um, on. Yeah, the, show, the showing world's very critical. And I find for me, if I've got a horse with a, a fault or a decent fault, the gossip mongers run with it, so you just can't. But but and I've proven it. I've sold horses on with faults, and they've been very successful. The gossip mongers don't seem to look at horses with other people. <laughs> but very very. Cool. So now DP Giselle is another mare um, that you had success with. Do you go looking for um, a mare in particular or a gelding, or is do you kind of look at it and say a good horse is a good horse regardless of its sex? Yeah, a good horse is a good horse. There's no doubt about that. 
to me, mares are a little bit trickier with the temperament. Uh, they're harder to find with a good temperament. A good mare is better than a good gelding, um, but they're very rare. And I find as far as a hack, um, mares have a certain look about them and I just don't think there's many mares out there. Like it sounds stupid, but they look merry. Uh, for me, um, when you compare them to a gelding, a gelding has a certain finish. I think it's more, it's more to do with just the flank and the rump area. Um, yes, yeah, so a good thoroughbred gelding is very hard to beat at, in type. Uh, but look, there's some bloody nice mares out there and I've had some nice mares and I always look at it at the end of the day, if they don't make it, they always make beautiful brood mares uh, to put with the riding pony stallions. Do you think, uh, with particularly with the thoroughbreds, and obviously their racing career, and again for the for the thoroughbred industry, the potential for mares to, to breed on, is it harder to find a, a good mare? Is that probably why there's less of them in the show ring? Dare I say? Oh, I think a lot of people don't like mares uh, as far as show horses. Mm. I know they're very popular in the polo because a good mare is a tough mare. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I would say it's only because a lot of people don't like mares. And, of course, some mares in the thoroughbred industry are used to breed thoroughbreds. Um, so they are hard to find, nice mares, uh, but they're worth their weight in gold if you find find a good one. Yeah. Oh, so. DP, DP Giselle was one that you did find. I think is that the photo on the left that you saw in horse deals, um, the magazine horse deals that um, often over the years people have found a diamond in the rough in there and this one was one that you found there. The head down there. Um, tell us about the story of DP Giselle. Well, it was, uh, we were in the midst of selling DP Amazing um, and we just happened to get horse, well, I happened to get horse deals, which I get religiously, and I spotted that one in the... Um, magazine and because my eyesight's not so good i'm thinking I, I she looks leggy she looks like she's got a nice body uh her head is low so her neck looks an okay shape in that um picture and the only thing i couldn't really tell was her head whether it was nice so i when heidi came out, i said oh have a look and what you think of this head uh we ended up ringing up and getting more photos and a video and the end of the at the end of the story, we were selling DP Amazing and her race name was She's Amazing and I thought, well, that's an omen, we've got a buyer. So we bought her and she was one of those ones that had a beautiful temperament, went in a beautiful um, rhythm and she was just very, very easy. From the day she arrived to the day she left to a new home, she never had a winter coat. She was just one of those easy, easy hacks anyone could enjoy and have fun with now you so, have um, sold her on do you what's the how often do you hold on to a horse and, and sell it did you wait for somebody to come along is it what's that sort of um like for you as a as an owner and producer yourself well there's there's i've always got a collection of horses here <laughs> um but some people can't see through fluff and not top condition and uh a lot People want them for less than what I pay for them. So, and look, I find it quite easy to find, say, novice winners at Royals. I think, like, I don't let them in the gate unless I think they can win a novice at a Royal. Um, but people still uh, think they can do it. Uh, and that's good. Go and do it. But, uh, like, it's not just a pretty head makes a good horse. I think a lot of people um, fall into that trap. They see a pretty head and think, well, that's going to be a Royal Show champion. There's more to a hack than a pretty head. Um, so, but we have, uh, I don't know, it's probably got seven or eight at the moment that could be going. I've got some brood, young ones, and some that we. Dale, DP Gangster and DP Kingdom are two um, horses that you uh, started. Um, what is it like, though, both of these thoroughbreds as well off the track, um, both of those have gone on to, to new homes. What's it like for you when you, you get these horses? Is that part of the journey for a lot of them, that you take them off the track, you do something with them, and you let them find their next homes? That's, that's the part I love. I love rehoming them and seeing them go on and be successful. So um, 
gangster was a horse that I spotted in the lead thoroughbred at Brisbane Royal. I don't know how many years ago, quite a few years ago. And um, I thought, yeah, I reckon I could do something for that. And luckily enough, I would say a couple of weeks after the, after the show, I purchased him and we got him going. I'm, oh, I would say we had him maybe 12 months. I'm not quite sure. And then Kerry Cock, that is the manager of Horse Deals, loved him and asked me whether he would be for sale. So he's got the most amazing home that any horse could ever want um, over in Mount Gambia. And he goes to the local shows. I don't know whether she's taken to any big ones, but uh, I think the plan is. But uh, she's a very busy girl. But uh, I couldn't ask for a better home for him and Kingdom. Same sort of thing. We took him to Adelaide show and um, people obviously noticed him there and asked whether he'd be for sale. And uh, he's gone to Jess Castle in uh, up near Sydney. And yeah. Great time. Um, I love I seeing him go. You like to see him go on. Yeah, excellent. To, uh, what I do want to ask you, how do you come up with their names? Where, where does Gangster come from? Where does Kingdom come from? Uh, gangster is his race name was Alphonse, and he was a gangster. Kingdom, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure with Kingdom. Um, <laughs> I like one word, and uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, DP Mayfair, because mm -hmm. I thought he was going to be very expensive. Uh, that's how he came up with the <laughs> where, uh, the name Mayfair. I thought, well, he's going to be an expensive horse, which he was when I sold him. Uh, so here's another one. I went to the Sydney sales to look at another horse and then spotted him there in the, st in the, uh, stable and ended up, and he only cost 1400 at the time. I think he had three starts for duck eggs. Um, I ended up ringing the trainer the two days after he was home say, saying, cause I couldn't believe what I got when I got home. I drove him. I thought this is a star. But I thought he might post most probably bucks or something. So I rang the trainer and the trainer said, No, he's he's not a rider and he could ride him. So and he was true. Um got on him and he was another one. I think these days there's obviously a lot of work put into the thoroughbreds um uh, before they race and while they're racing. So when you get them off the track, they're a much better horse to have, much easier to get going, um, which is great for my business. Uh, but years ago, God, they didn't have mouths and you just you wonder how you got them around the track, let alone a circle in the show ring. But uh, these days, the breaking in process and the educating process that the thoroughbreds go through is great for my business. So, um, And he's, he's a perfect example. He was beautifully broken in, had a beautiful mouth and just was very easy. Very much a show horse he was too, DP Mayfair. Now tell me, is there a correlation between uh, the horse's success on the track um, and any decision that you make in terms of them? Do you find that um, the ones that are, do well on the track are often the better perform, better, better uh, put together horses or anything like that? Is there any, any sort of correlation that you find? No, I can't say that. I can't say that. Like. <laughs> One of my first, how oh, I think my second good hack was, and I couldn't find his um, breeding, was a horse called Cruz, and he had 97 starts. Um, mm. And he won quite a few. I think they were mainly in the country. And he didn't start showing until he was nine. Um, and he had a knockdown hip. Uh, no, no judge ever picked up on that. Um, and he actually won the first two Grand Nationals that they ever had. So... In his showing career with me, he, the worst he ever got was two thirds. The rest was either first or second. So um, he was very successful and very sound for a horse that had 98 starts or whatever it was. And um, so, yeah, I don't find I've had some really good ones that are absolutely useless on the track, and I've had some nice ones that have been. I had no, I've got one here at the moment that was one uh, as one 4.5 million, I think, Galo Shop. Yep. Um, he's a he's a very successful racehorse, the most successful one I've had, and um, like he, yeah, you can see he's, or you can tell he's been around the world a bit. Like he's very easy to handle and everything. Uh, lovely, lovely boy. So he'll most probably come out this year, and um, I think he'll be in the hunter classes. So, Excellent. but. Now, um, um, yeah. 
Yeah, the other horse okay. that we see on the screen there is uh, is Sunspot or Knowing. Um, for those uh, sort of saddle horse enthusiasts, the Dam of Royalwood Centre Stage opening night, Chorus of Love, Black Swan, uh, and, and of course Royalwood Concerto. Um, I mentioned in the intro that uh, a lot of horses have passed through your stables. This is one of them that you had your hands on early, and uh, what yeah. a what a wonderful legacy she's left. Yeah, she's or she'd be the most successful show horse broodmare there is in Australia, um, and she uh, we picked her up out at Flemington and we showed her for a little while, and then she was sold on. To, I think she went through a couple of homes. Um, and then Joanne Presswich was lucky enough to get her to breed from and uh, just shows you that a good thoroughbred mare. And at the time, the sire she was by Sunspart, there was a couple of, I remember a couple of racehorses at Epsom. I'm showing my age now because Epsom doesn't even exist anymore. There um, was a couple of racehorses there by Sunsmart. They're all nice types. So there are things that you, like talking about the stallions and that, that you follow. I do look at them, but then uh, you if see the goods some. Aren't there, yeah, the yeah. goods aren't there at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what the breeding is, really. Exactly. I, I do look. Like, if I've got a good one by a horse, I'll sort of look up others. But when you look later on the slides at how many I've got up there without being all of them, there's not many by the same sire. Yeah. We might move on to the next slide then and talk about uh, a couple of these younger horses that you've got. This one, DP Sovereign, um, race name Scenic Find by Scenic. Uh, what do you like about this horse? Where did you find this one? Well, he, a friend of mine um, who used to work on, on the track, um, he told me he'd seen a nice horse. And um, it, I think it might have been his second start and it didn't do any good. And uh, he approached the trainer and my friend is very blunt and, he said, oh, do you want to sell your horse? And he goes, no, no, it's going to be a good horse. He goes, mate, I wouldn't win a goat race. Well, anyway, he went on to race 80, 80, 98 times and won 13. So, um, and we, I end up getting him. I chased him for all those years. And uh, a friend of mine, Bettina Stanton, brought him off me. And he had an accident at her place going through a gateway. So he never... I think he might have went to one or two shows. I'm not sure whether he actually competed, but she was getting ready to go to a show and um, he injured himself. So he's uh, just retired in the paddock. And the other horse there, these are these were here a while ago. Uh, we're just going through photos, trying to find thoroughbreds that I've had. He actually never went to a show either. He stood here for a long time. He... Got his leg hooked up the fence a couple of times. I don't know why, because that's normally a mare thing. But um, and in the end, he ended up unsound. So he, but he was a lovely type of a horse. Um, <coughs> very elegant front, this is sort of the type I look for. Mm. But we with these horses, do you prefer? Um, obviously, you said you enjoy when they go on to their new homes uh, and and you know rehoming them. But do you prefer to start them first? Is that sort of is that part of what you like about the journey, giving them the start, seeing how they come along, or are you happy for somebody else to do that? Uh, yeah, I, I like to start them. I love, I love taking them to the show, and then uh, normally after they finish out, I'm bored, so <laughs> I want to get. But I do love it. Um, I just love looking for horses. I never stop looking. I'm always watching the TV. Go to the track. Go to the wherever. Like I always look, looking through horse deals um, and look, you, it's hard to judge on a photo because these days some of the photos aren't so true, um, but you never judge it standing as far as I'm, go I'm concerned with the show horse. It's always got to be, you've got to take going. So the ugliest horse can look very nice going where the previous one is very awkward. Um, now, there are a lot of them, um, just further down the slides. We might move on to that next slide and, and, and look at a few more of them. Um, all carrying the DP prefix uh, in uh, Believing, Zavros, Perfection, Galaxy, Galaxy, Sorrento and Choir. These are, are these some of the horses you have started? Um, tell us about those and, and I guess with some of them, what, uh, what's sort of drawn you to them? What, what are their um, kind of uh, positives, I guess, that you found with these horses? Oh. DP Believing is a horse that Robbie Griffiths trained just locally and I'd seen him um, 
at the track and at the races and always thought, gee, he's a nice horse. And um, overall picture, like he's well balanced, everything. Um, and just I was reading him about another one that I'd bought off him, which went on to Sarah Love because she wanted to know his microchip or his race name and I'd forgotten it. And while I was talking to him, I said, oh, what's happening with Believing? And he said, well, he actually is for sale, um, but they were going to sell him as a racehorse so he, because he hadn't finished his race career, so they wanted a bit of money. And uh, so we went and had a look, and uh, a client of mine was there when we looked. And when the horse came around the corner, he goes, geez, I hope that's him. And it, it was him because it's normally you go into a stable and go, God, I hope it's not that, and it's normally that. But... Um, <laughs> And uh, anyway, it was him and we bought him, or oh, I bought him for Heidi and um, my client, Kurt Crowther, who didn't think he could uh, do a thoroughbred again because he'd just got back into showing. He was here and I think it was maybe our fourth ride and I said, oh, do you want to have a ride? And he got on and had a ride and he's another one with a lovely temperament and uh, he had a ride and he goes, it's easy. And I said, well, it is easy if you get the right one. And... Uh, <laughs> He said, well, I think I could do it. Would you sell him? And I said, well, ask Heidi because I'd bought him for Heidi. And uh, anyway, end of story, Kurt's got him. He's still here. We um, produce him for him and he comes down when he can from Brisbane and rides him, but he's a lovely horse. Zavros was another one, local trained horse that um, Sarah Berry put me onto, who works for Greg, Greg Urell. He actually was going to go in the derby, but uh, did a flight tendon so he um didn't fulfill his racing career and we've had him here for a long time he's he's a lovely big horse for a seven he's like his genuine 17 hand um well put together um just a really nice kind quiet horse quality horse uh dp perfection that's the newest one to come out and because of the name he's the closest one i've seen to perfect um he's just the overall package he can move he straight legs uh he's just a quality horse although he seems to have a very good temperament uh dp choir was at a rehoming place i found him on facebook um just happened to be looking on facebook at the right time he's been down here now with us like he's a horse that i think we will keep for the kids to go on the gary owen um like you seen again beautiful temperament just lucky to be able to get one off facebook that's got a uh, beautiful temperament and very cheap uh sorrento is another one that we've got here we've had him here and this is what happens we've had him here for two years he's gone nowhere uh he daisy claimed him he never actually i don't think he raced i think he might have had two trials and they just absolutely useless <laughs> um, so a genuine, quiet, lovely horse and just with all the work that Daisy's doing on it, he'll come out this year, hopefully, if there is a show. Um, let's go on to the next. Let's where I want to do yeah, that. Well, uh, took, um, for those people that might be uh, joining us on the live stream, don't know you do have two young children in Daisy and Poppy. You mentioned to us last weekend, and of course Heidi rides as well, your your partner. Um, you mentioned to us last weekend that you're, you're you're getting on too much now to worry about horses that give you too much grief. But the temperament is really important, and you can find that in the thoroughbred, can't you? For you, for both for Heidi and for the children as well, to enjoy the thoroughbred with a good temperament. Oh, yeah, there's, there's plenty out there with a good temper. And I find, um, like, years ago, I used to just get them home and I'd have them in a double bridle and take them to show two weeks after I got them. But these days, um, like, as I say, there's Sorrento. He's been here for two years. Just uh, day, I was Daisy was just riding him before when I started this. Um, he's here. He's fed. He's not stable, but he's fed and in the paddock and she might ride him three times a week, but then he might have three weeks off and she just gets straight on him and goes out like you. If you treat them the right way, treat them like horses, I find they're very good. Very, very good temperament. So there's the odd one, but you get that in any breed. Yeah. Um, as a rule, um, well, they don't come on the property if they haven't got the temperament. But uh, long anyway, I'm, sure. um, I'm just thinking this little slide, Nice Bridge. He was uh, 
a horse that I spotted on TV, just watching TV one day and saw him trot across the screen, which was DP Polo. Uh, he's gone on. Well, he was actually bought out of the paddock um, here and by a friend. He produced him for a little while and then sold him on. And uh, he's, well, he was going to go to Brisbane. He would have been at Brisbane this week. Um, but Brisbane's been called off and I think he's maybe 18. So um, they still go on uh, yeah. and they're still successful. He, he won a uh, ladies' hack at the last Melbourne show. So um, if you look after them and do the right thing by them, they're still out there winning. And nothing makes me happier than seeing horses with the DP prefix out there doing it. Yeah. Now, Dave, we haven't seen you ride in the ring for a few years, but I do understand you are making a comeback with DP Perfection. We have been riding uh, recently. Um, is this is it something that over the last few years you've seen the girls um, go on to ride a bit more and you're kind of getting success out of that? Are you, are you getting hungry again to, to jump on the thoroughbred in the ring again? Um, look, when, when the girls were young, it was just I found it too hard to be the strapper and ride. And then we've got a couple of clients that we help out as well. So it's just too hard. You can't do it all. Um, and then uh, because the girls are getting older and they're into the thoroughbred or getting into the thoroughbreds and um, of course they're not, my girls are timid riders. So I've got to be very careful and uh, I don't want anyone injured. So I just thought, well, I'd better try and start. And I'll tell you what, it was very hard work at the start. I felt way out of place, uh, way too fat, and I still am, but I'm working on it. Uh, I feel a little bit more part of the horse these days. And I have to say, it, it is fun to be out there and having a go. Um, and I always said, if I get the right horse, I'll make a big effort. And uh, this one is the right horse, I think, in my eyes. Nice. Yeah, we might move through the slides. Um, if Paul, if you want to move through to the slide that says Gigolo and Neon, a couple of horses um, here in these in these last ones where um, you know we have seen some great horses in the ring in Gigolo and Neon, uh, and then the following slide talks about very scandal covers colours, um, some beautiful horses. Tell us about these horses, and um, for those people that might be watching that have just joined the the showing and, and aren't sure of a few horses of the past, Gigolo was a very um, impressive horse in the ring. Neon had some great success. Talk to us about some of these thoroughbreds. Well, Gigolo, Neon, and there's uh, Colours, which is on another slide, and Murph, they all came from John Hawkes' stables when he was at Epsom. I always, oh, well... They were in his stables when he was at Epson. Epson doesn't even exist anymore. Um, Murph, I didn't actually own, but I wanted to get him. But a Sarah, the late Sarah Redpath, had bought him, and um, she sent him to me to campaign as a hunter. And um, he he was an impressive horse, not top quality, and he had a good brain. But because of the well, my old show jumping background, uh, horses by Grosvenor were mm -hmm. um, known to be wow. jumping. So I sort of persuaded her into um, letting me jump him. And at, at the time, I thought I was going to do it, but it was just too hard to do the hacks. And like the D, in those days, the D grade was always the first class of the show, and so were the hack ring. So it was hard to be in the hack ring and the jumping ring at the same time. Um, so I only uh, took him to a few events and he was just so impressive. Um, Christy Bruin from down Mount Gambia's father contacted me and well, he ended up down there. And they were, like he was a World Cup show jump winner uh, and reportedly open, um, offered open checks for him. Uh, we can go to Scandal, which is the next one. Oh, yeah, she's the one. Um, so I bought her uh, on say so the Crawford twins in New South Wales. They said this bloke used to bring this black horse or black mare down to Sydney to race, and they'd stopped. They lived on the highway, I think, uh, in Singleton, and uh, stopped in one day to see if he could take his horse float. And um, they obviously liked the horse and said when it was for sale, could they he let them know? And uh, he did, but they weren't interested. So she told they told me about her. I um, 
bought her over the phone and when she arrived she again she had a little little bit of an apple joint and she wasn't really the type i was after um a little bit low set in front um so i just put her in the paddock and then out of the blue i thought oh, i'd give her a go a free jump and, uh, a little cross rail she couldn't even jump that. and i don't know why but Two weeks later, say, I got her in and gave her another go at free jumping. Well, she jumped that little crossway gazelle and never looked back. And I just was so excited and slowly built the jump up a bit higher. And I started asking around, like, did anyone want to buy or come and look at this horse? Like, it's really good. But um, I suppose, to be fair, the people in Victoria didn't know that I used to show jump. So they were all like, what would you know? <laughs> Just a bad show horse that can't, it's not, not good enough for a show ring, so he's just trying to flog it off, is that thoughts? 15 3 and it's a man, no, no, no. Uh, then eventually I rang the Wagners to see when Chris Chug and George Santa were coming down, because um, I know they knew I used to jump, come down to the do the run of shows, and then Peter said, Oh, could we come and have a look? So he came over and had a look, and it, like it was a hilarious day because I just I'd free jumped her that morning and I just was that excited. I had to ring someone. So I rang them to find out about this, these people. He came over that afternoon and I actually had never ridden her. And I free jumped her again. And again, she just would jump like the size of a 44 gallon drum. She'd clear by three. Like it was just amazing every time. So he said, Oh, what's she like to ride? I said, I don't know. So I got on and we put it down to a little cross rail. She came in and jumped so bloody high over it. I thought she was going to pelt me. And um, so I did that a couple of times. Then Peter hopped on and had a ride and came around to jump so high he landed on the pommel of the saddle. So he uh, didn't want to jump anymore. Then, to cut the story short, we took him down to their place. Um, he had proper jumps. And we jumped up a lane of jumps. And she just, again, I said earlier on that some of them realise they don't have to jump so high, don't or try so hard and she just didn't jump that good that day and because um, I was originally going to sell a half share in her and uh, anyway they ended up buying her I think it was three or four years later they reportedly got one point something million for her as a show jumper to the Princess of Jordan so mm. big mistake I made. <laughs> but yes I don't know what show jumpers are like and then we had I had another one that I bought through Mick Kent uh, from Cranbourne or a show horse, uh, and I don't have him on the slide because I can't, I know his name is DP Envy as a show show jumper, but um, a client or a person I didn't actually really didn't know came along and wanted to want a horse and I showed him this one and he didn't get on and have a ride so I had no idea that he could, whether he could ride or not, but he said, yeah, he wanted to buy him, he wanted to keep him with me for 12 months, so that was all good and in that time, he kept shying at something on the arena. I thought, I'll fix you, I'll make you jump it. Well, he could really jump as well. So then I tried to buy the horse back and he wouldn't sell him to me. <coughs> Excuse me. Three, um, I think it was like three years later, I eventually got him back. He went to George Santa. Anyway, end of the story, end up with, I can't even think of his name. Oh, he's going to kill me. Anyway, a local bloke. He was my barrier. God. Ended up with him. He won the Australian Championships. Uh, again, World World Cup show jumper. Very good. So you can, uh, thoroughbreds can make it to the highest of levels in the show jumping. But they don't, they don't seem to be after them as much because there's purpose-bred warm bloods these days. Mm -hmm. But I still don't think can be a good thing. Uh, for those people that are joining us on the live stream and uh, probably haven't got the experience that you have, what would you say is the most important thing when you do go looking for these horses? You've looked at hundreds, thousands of horses over your lifetime. You're very, um, I guess, trained eye now when it comes to it. What would you say for people that are, might be starting out looking for a thoroughbred off the track, um, you know, or, or, or looking for their next show ring superstar? Uh, well, it's got to be the overall look, overall picture. Got to, as I say, you got to see them go. Um, you want them in the self carriage if you can get them. You've got to sit up in front, um, and the temperament. I mean, you got to 
bring into consideration, yes, they're not like when you go to look them, they're normally really fit and really fed up. Uh, but these days, um, if they're sweating up and carrying on like lunatics in the tie-up stalls, I wouldn't go near them. So temperament is a big thing. And these days, as I said earlier, um, they're just broken in so much better. And a lot of them do get schooling in like when they're coming into pre-training and all that. So they are uh, you're getting a better product at their end of the race career. So um, I think they're doing a great job with them at the moment, coming off the track. I can't complain. Mm. But that's what I look at, the overall picture. And it's not a pretty hair contest. It's the overall picture. That's all I can see. Mm. You want straight, straight legs, of course. Uh, I don't mind little marks, little nicks. Uh, these days, the judges, judges don't seem to even look. So um, as long as their po uh, toes point the forward and uh, they sit up and carry you, uh, that's what I look for. Well, we look forward to seeing you pointing your toes or DP Perfection pointing his toes with you on board uh, in the coming months. But hopefully we get out of this lockdown and we get some shows back on the calendar. So it's oh, been great, Dale. Yeah. Thanks so much for chatting with us. Uh, an absolute wealth of knowledge, um, years and years of, of hard work and consistent, consistent champions, as I said, and very much a, a lover of off-the-track thoroughbreds. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Dale Plum there, with, uh, with today's Masterclass, choosing the perfect off-the-track off thoroughbred for you. This is Go For Glory and her nickname's Tessie and she came to me through the reset program after being surrendered to the RSPCA. She's been here 12 weeks now. When she first arrived, um, there was a lot of things that she needed confidence with. Once she got confident with me, I could do pretty much anything with her. And we threw a football over her. We did round the world and sliding all over her and played Superman on her. She just was really unsure and her reaction to that is to just stand still. So it's been great to have her confidence now. During their um, broodmare careers, they're in the in and out crushes and they're, they're led around with foals and they have to go through all the weaning process. They're in paddocks with other horses. So they've always had interaction with people. And I think to just throw them out in a paddock and leave them, would, it just doesn't do any benefit to them. So I think they quite enjoy doing something else. She's really nice to ride. She is really, she will try for you. So she's easy to educate because she just soaks it all in. She loves to be patted and kissed. And, you know, I think she would really um, thrive in a condition where she was like interacting with a lot of people. You know, all the variety of things that you get to do. For these type of horses in the reset program, I think that they can get missed because they're not you know, the, the really flashy show horse. So it's a really good avenue for people to actually acquire a really nice horse that's done the retraining that will get a good home after it because they are trained. For her next home, I'd love her to have someone who wants to do a bit of everything, um, to trail ride, to do a bit of um, working equitation or low level dressage. I think she would just excel or even go to an all round pony club home would be great because she is a quiet horse. Russell Johnson has called the Victorian show jumping stables near Whittlesea home for close to 30 years, during which time he has forged himself as a serious show jumping competitor and a renowned coach. When it comes to the show jumping arena, it seems that Russell has done it all. An Olympic competitor at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, representing Australia at the Finland, Norway and Sweden Nations Cup shows, he's completed the infamous Hickstead Derby. He's been a World Cup qualifier winner five times leading rider at Melbourne and Adelaide Royal Shows and was the New South Wales Australian show jumping champion in 2000. Now, just when anyone thought Russell's best days were before him, Russell was crowned the EV show jumping coach of the year in 2019, the EV show jumping rider of the year in 2020, and whilst his most recently successful horse, Depreece, was declared the EV show jumping horse of the year in 2020. 
As well as Russell, Russell's personal riding career, Russell also finds time to train and coach riders of all ages, as well as training and educating a range of horse breeds. In recent years, Russell has been involved in Racing Victoria's off-the-track program Jump Off Series, where he paired his show jumping skills with the versatility of the thoroughbred. And today we continue in understanding Russell's thoughts when it comes to choosing the perfect off-the-track thoroughbred for you. Russell Johnson, well, firstly, congratulations on a stellar career to date and thanks for joining us for today's Masterclass. You're welcome. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Seems um, like you have done yeah, it. Like, yeah, I've been around for a while, haven't I? <laughs> I wasn't going to put it that way. But first, before we do get started, I do want to ask, COVID's hit us here in Victoria for the se for the sixth time we're in lockdown, but how are you going? Is it giving you more time to, to focus on the horses away from the competition arena? Yeah, it is. And and to be honest, uh, Jeremy, I think the um, it's enabled me to get all these job, get through the job list that's been building up over the last 25 years. So, um, you know, and I'm, I still seem to have a lot of things on the on the job list. Uh, I guess at my stage of my career too, you know, it... Um, you know, it's, if I was a young fella, I'd be pretty disappointed, you know, especially with a, a large mortgage or something. But um, it's, you know, we, it, it's not been too bad. And we've got, I mean, we're sitting, we're fortunate, we're on 20 acres, so and we've got the indoor arena and we've got plenty of things to do. So, yeah, yeah we're very fortunate. Like that. Always something to do. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Fix It. That's what my uh, wife calls me. I want to ask you, it's very timely. We're seeing the last few days of, uh, of the Tokyo Olympics happening at the moment. Atlanta in 96. Look, not many of us can, can claim to be a, a competitor at an Olympic Games. Uh, you were fortunate enough as well to be involved in the, in the ceremonies as well. What's it like to go to represent your country at an, a, a competition like that? And what is an Olympic Games uh, as a competitor? Tell us about that. Ah, uh, look, it, um, you almost have to pinch yourself to think that you finally got there you know like the whole the whole story and the, the support to get there is, is enormous um and it, it really it's the stars need to line up you know it often it intrigues me when i see the jockeys at the melbourne cup saying this is our olympics well it, it's not close to comparable because at the melbourne cup there's 24 starters every year every year. now i mean when i went to the olympics it was four starters every four years now it's three starters every four years so you know you really need the stars to line up as to having the right horse at the right time and i mean that's a huge skill uh, in itself to be able to have a network that can keep you up there at the right time um yeah. obviously it's it's a huge for me it was almost like a huge relief in some ways because you you keep working towards a goal uh, and then it's like wow you know and um, the opening ceremony, yeah, it's very special. I mean, from an athlete's point of view, um, it's a pretty drawn-out day. Um, you get put on a bus at Atlanta, and then we um, we were all um, we all sat around in a baseball stadium next to the main uh, Olympic stadium. So we sat there for a, oh, I forget now. It would have been yeah. at least two or three hours before the uh, before we march in. And you hear all the uh, opening ceremony starting next door and, and then slowly you uh, all make your way over. And it's probably, I guess, when we come over the hill uh, into the actual stadium, it's like, wow, you know, we're, we're actually here. This is happening. So, yeah, yeah it was pretty special. Yeah, Perfect. very yeah. special, actually. When you're watching the Olympics on TV, do you, does it sort of make you reminisce and, and kind of wish you, were, wish you were competing at, at Olympics again? No doubt it's a lot of hard work. Oh, hell you? yeah. Um, especially this games because my horse de Priest was going really well like he was qualified there to to go to the games or qualified to be selected yeah. um, but then you know the stars didn't quite line up we ran into a couple little injury problems and uh, we weren't able to put the performances in at the right time so um, we, we didn't get selected so so that was you know and then you look at it and you think ah how would he have gone you know that's the way I look at it I mean I've had the stuff here with the course plans out and the distances and figuring out what I would have done or what I think I would have done. And, and the thing too, with all competition, it's split second decisions and yeah. how horses feel at the time. And did they travel well? Um, you know, if they didn't travel well and got any sickness there, travel sickness, all that's got to be worked on. And, 
and horses you know they're it's pretty easy to um to to worry them in a warm-up if you don't get that warm-up right um you've wrecked your round yeah. um so there's there's an awful lot to it and but that sport you know it's no different to the only problem for us that makes it different is it's not just our performance it's an animal's performance yeah. and yeah trying to look after that animal and and get him get him through or her through yeah now in 96 it was in, in 1996 it was on a, on a thoroughbred that you competed as well to have the thoroughbreds always been for you um something that's really quite special i mentioned in the intro they're quite a versatile breed tell us about the thoroughbred and, and what interests you with the thoroughbred as a show jumper yeah well my generation i mean that's pretty much all we had you know that we didn't have the warm bloods around um that we have today you know so we uh, we really cut our teeth with horses off the track um there wasn't even really many purpose there was a few early breeders with um some of the thoroughbred lines that were renowned for for jumping but they were far and few between um and certainly not the numbers that we we have today uh so all of us our teeth with horses off the track uh and so we, we grew up with x race horses and that's that's what you did and also that's how we made a living we were we we're buying horses off the track retraining them if they didn't suit show jumping then they went on as eventers or not so much the dress even the dressage horses in the early days were all thoroughbreds as well i think crown law was a thoroughbred uh, i don't believe he raced but he was certainly a thoroughbred and he was our first dressage competitor correct me if i'm wrong um at big games for dressage mm. yeah yeah. Now we might uh, move through the slides that you've prepared for us today. Talk to us about um, when, when it comes to the thoroughbreds and the first impressions. Is that often for you the, the starting point? Or obviously, the, it is the starting point. But what's that? What do you look for when you when the first impressions when you come across a thoroughbred? Yeah. Well, a little bit like I've got there the the slides. The first thing I'm having a bit of a look at is the size. Um, I mean, look, there are some really outstanding small horses throughout history. Um, you know, blues and strollers, um, but they tend to be a bit more on the freaky side. So it's a numbers game, and and I've sort of I've not had a lot of luck with huge horses either. Um, I think they're a little bit more prone to uh, injury. Um, so I'm really looking for something in that 16-1 to 16-3 range, and I'm a real big tall fella either. So you know I don't need a real big horse. Um, so the, the smaller ones will suit me, but um, so that's yeah that's that comes into it i'm really not oh look you know you get something with a freaky jump well i'm i'm going to work with it but um as a rule <laughs> you're going to say no um, if it's 15 2 and it's, got say it, no. it's unbelievable yeah exactly yeah. yeah and the other thing is when i first set eyes on the horse i'm i'm straight away studying his temperament you know how's he behaving in the stables or in the cross ties where we're about to have a look you know is he is he uptight is he on his own can he handle being on his own? All those types of things. Uh, it's giving me a bit of an indicator of his temperament. Um, and then I guess the, the next thing I'm doing, as soon as I walk up to them, I'm having a look at their eye. Their eye gives me an indication of their temperament. I mean, there's no doubt you can see a worried look in a horse or a, a really calm, relaxed look. So that comes into it. And, and from there, it's straight down onto um, any signs for old injuries. So running down tendons, having a look at tendons, having a look for joints. Have we got any abnormal swellings in the joints? Um, you know, and vices, uh, wind suckers, I've, I'm not worried about that. Um, weaving is probably a bit more of an issue as far as any um, vices go as to how that's going to end up on their front legs long term, pressure on joints. But uh, no, I've, had a, I've had plenty of very successful wind suckers over the years, so I'm not worried about that at all. Um, so long as they hold their condition with the wind sucking, you know, the, if they're so chronic that they don't eat, that's going to be a problem. But, yeah, so that's my first impression with them. When it comes and, to, the, to the injury, Russell, with this, how much, uh, what, what are you willing to, to give? You know, where, where's that sort of line? Um, do you always get a vet check? When yeah, you look, you? Yeah. yeah, I've seen plenty of good horses come back from bowed tendons. Um, so, I mean, maybe the bowed tendon is not a big deal. Um, superficial digital, yeah, that's getting a bit, bit more of an issue. Um, so I mean, look, if you're really serious about them, I'm just going to handball that on to the vets. 
Yeah. Um, so you're really going to get them scanned. I'm still going to look at the horse so long as he's not lame, um, but I'll I'll be guided by my vet. Yeah. When it comes to um, to any particular breeding of thoroughbreds, is there anything in particular? Um, we chatted with uh, with Dale Plum, and, and he's he's had you know countless thoroughbreds across the years, and he sort of said, you know what, I, I look at the horse in front of me. There might be particular lines, but you know the Grosvenor line was a very yeah. uh, well known show jumping line. Is there something you particularly go after, or you you very much the same? Look at the horse in front of you. No, not not really that interested in the breeding. Um, definitely take them as they are. Um, I've had them, with, especially with the thoroughbreds, coming from such a broad uh, range of breed, breeding, um, I've had success from many different lines. So, I mean, if I see something that's similarly bred to good horses I've had, for sure, I'll, I'll prick my ears, but yeah. um, not, not as a rule. And, and my first thing I, I love doing with them is, is free jumping them. Um, it's such a useful tool. It's not the be all and the end all. Um, but I really like to, to give them a free jump early. The, the benefit, the big benefit of the, the free jumping is that um, their rider, any issues with rideability won't come into play for the actual the, the jump technique. So, um, you know, if they haven't been mouthed properly and they don't travel well with the contact or anything like that, it's all eliminated. We can have a look. And, and really, as a trainer, I like to think that I can improve all of that anyway, but I can't improve on their, their natural ability. Um, so, you know, if I can jump them, that's my ultimate. Um, even in a bull ring, sometimes at the back of the race courses and that, we've done that a few, several times. Um, so, you know, and I'm just looking for different techniques. Um, I don't know whether we had a, a video there at this yeah, stage, Jeremy, but... Yeah, we do have that coming up. What does stick to this, this free jump for now? Um, as a person who's yeah. not a free jumper, what is it what you look for when you when you say you're free jumping them? Um, does it have to be the highest, the higher the horse jumps? More about its sort of no. its willingness to, to look at the jump and how it sort of tackles the tackles the jump. Yeah, definitely. It's it's the, the actual technique that the horse uses over the jump. So their ability to snap their front legs up, the shape they make in the air over the fence. Um, do they jump flat? Do they get up and comes up come up through the wither nicely? Um, then also their back leg technique. Do they are they do they have a natural uh, disposition to opening up behind, or do they clam up behind? That's going to indicate the, their scope or their ability to scope with big fences later on. Um, how they handle a free jump. Often, this is the first time that these horses we see have ever done a free jump. Um, so you're looking at their attitude as to how they figure things out. Um, but it also while they're even galloping around the arena having a bit of a look at how they move it'll yeah. soon show you any unevenness any any lameness um also in the corners their ability to make the flying change uh, they'll show you that pretty quickly whether they can do it or whether it's going to be hard work for them um and you know i've even had some horses they just they just hate it it's just not their thing and uh, some of those horses they'll just go and stand in the put their head in the corner and they're like, no, mate, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Um, well, that's not really the horse I'm looking for. It's easily discounted, so, uh, isn't it, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the old story. You, you can take them to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, it's a bit like that with their jump too. And, and look, yeah. it's the, the horses that find it easy, um, they really enjoy it. Uh, whereas the ones that, that have generally have the technique problems, then they just find it hard and, they're not happy about it. And they, they let you know, you soon pick it, especially if you look at different ones. And, and I will say this, that the free jump's not the be all and the end all. Um, you know, sometimes I've had some pretty fancy looking free jumpers that just weren't careful enough. Um, but I've never yet had a good jumper, a uh, successful jumper that didn't free jump well. So yeah. it's a, a really good guide. We might move through um, to the video and watch that we've got a grey horse here um, that uh, that you've got on the free jump. As we watch this video, I just want to ask you, what do you, what height do you generally free jump them at? Do you, um, when you're first starting to look at a horse? Yeah. Like, yeah, do you look at them and say, this is where the horse fits into to what grade you think it's going to get to? Yeah, look, most horses with any ability, um, and when you set it up, we set the free jump up with the three fences to make it easy for them. 
and and will alter the distances a little bit depending on the capacity of the horse and and how they're handling it. Um, most horses they'll sort of jump around that 90 centimeter. I, I want to see them over an oxer, um, and I don't mind if it's a slightly rising oxer, um, but I want to see them over an oxer around about that 90. And most horses, even on their first free jump, are very capable of doing that. And so that 90 centimeter, one meter mark, that's enough to get a good indication of the technique, especially the first time. And like the last thing you want to be doing is, is letting them get hurt. So we start with the fences very small, uh, just little crossbars and slowly work it up. And, and we won't even put all three fences there for starters. We might only have one fence and just let them run through the race a couple of times, then add an extra fence and then finally build it up to the third fence. And the one stride, one stride, I've seen, works very well for us. And if you look at any of the, um, the German, um, what's the word, uh, assessment overseas there, they, they do the same process. So uh, it, it just makes it a bit easier for them. And quite a few horses can have a bit of trouble with the first fence. The super careful ones, don't they? Yeah. And I guess you probably, you're not wanting to put the horse in the deep end too much. You want to give it the best opportunity to, to impress you, don't you? No, no. The aim with all training with show jumpers is that they must never get hurt. If they get hurt, they start to lose confidence. And the really good ones, they only have to be hurt once or twice and they start to get worried. And some of the really good ones only have to think they're going to get hurt before they start to get worried. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, these horses that we're, and the, the, sort of, the sort of horse we're looking for with the thoroughbred as well, uh, I mean, a lot of the warm blood breeders, they're breeding these ultra careful horses. They're not the easiest horses to ride. They're not police horses. They're really sensitive characters. And the off the track thoroughbred we're looking for is a pretty sensitive animal as well. You know, yeah. they've, they've all they have that huge desire not to touch the rail. So as a, as when you're doing your free jumping, it really does take a bit of a trained eye to assess the moment that horse is starting to struggle. And if they're starting to struggle, it's time to back off. They've had enough. Um, and they soon show you whether they're, they're capable or not. Yeah. We might move through um, to the second horse. We've got a chestnut horse here as well um, on the video. Uh, also free jumping yep. that as well. Um, with the grey horse, was that a, a horse that you, is that something you've got at the, at the moment in the stables? Yeah, no, he's not here at the stables. Um, he was one that we, uh, was a client's, we worked, we trained for a client. Um, and I just, I thought that there was the free, the, that particular free jump was very nice. It, um, it was a novice horse. I think that was maybe that horse's second free jump from memory. Um, and it just, it came up through the wither really nicely. Its front end was was really good, and it started to open up a little bit behind. So that's the type of jump that we're definitely looking for. Looking for the With this chestnut horse. horse. Yep. Yep. Another Talk another neat you. horse. Yep. Yep. Um, good in front. Um, probably you can see in the video just jumped a little bit flatter than the grey horse, so a little bit quicker through the air. Um, but again, nice behind too. Started to open up. Good example. Really good example. And so I've noticed here as well, you send the horse sort of around the around the end of the arena. Um, you mentioned before seeing how the horse changes itself. So by letting it come around there, you've sort of, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you're checking the horse out in its stride and how, how, how it looks after itself, yep. I guess, too. Definitely, yep, how well it handles itself on its feet. And quite often you'll see them, I mean, horses are left and right-handed like we are. Um, predominantly, most horses I've found over the years are definitely left-handed. Um, when I was doing some work in Germany, um, I started to think that perhaps they were a little bit more right-handed up there. And uh, I was with one of the old German legends, Peter Luther. And I said to Luke, Peter one day, I said, Peter, in Germany, are most horses left-handed or right-handed? He didn't even have to think about it for two seconds. He just said left-handed. Yeah. So, um, do you think, um, that sure. the, so that we tend to do most of our pre-jumping on the yeah. left rein as a result. Now that doesn't yeah. mean we don't get right-handed horses. Yeah. And then really looking for them. And as they get a bit tired, they'll change lead as well. Yeah. So uh, they tend to go on one lead. And then I'm looking for to see whether they can do that flying change in the corner coming around towards that first fence. Yeah. Do you find um, the impact of, of horses that have raced, uh, whether that has an impact on, on, on their, you know, their leading leg or their, no? No, none whatsoever. 
they're born left and right handed just like we are. Yeah. There was, in fact, um, there was an old old theory. I mean, it's over 200 years ago. It was an old German guy called Musler, and he spoke about it. He reckoned whichever way the fetus was bent in the uterus is whichever way they're going to come out. So I don't know. Uh, maybe yeah. with scans and that these days, you could do a, a <laughs> test on it. But at the end of the day, they are what they are. They are. So yeah. um, it won't make any difference. Absolutely. But no, they're definitely born that way. Mm. Uh, we might move through the slides here. Now we move into to lunging. Um, you, you know, yep. if you can't free jump the horse, then uh, they put it on the yep. lunge. Talk to us about yep. what, what that sort of tr uh, shows you. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to the free jump as well. Um, again, I'm just looking straight away to see how, how the horse moves. Um, and when I say how the horse moves, I'm also... I'm not really look, I'm looking for a big extravagant mover for the dressage test. Uh, I'm really watching their hock action. I want to see a, a, a real good bend in the hock. I believe that if I can get, if you have a horse with a good bend in the hock, his balance is better and he's going to have a good mouth. Um, he's not going to be struggling so much to keep his balance. So um, that's one thing I'm looking for. And I'm certainly looking that he's not uneven. I mean, soundness is such a big thing. It's, uh, it's huge. And, you know, so over the years, I think quite a few of the guys I've known who've been training racehorses uh, seem to think that what we're doing is, um, is oops, sorry about that, yeah. is not that hard on horses. Um, well, <laughs> if you had a look at the Olympic Games the other night, um, holy smokes, those horses, they are at the absolute max of uh, physical capacity for a horse um, and then with the speed that they're traveling um, is there's one thing I noticed from the Olympics from when I went to what it is now uh, I think the speed is definitely faster um, they're measuring the courses a lot tighter um, the distances also look a little longer um, which puts a lot more stress on these horses yeah so um, and, soundness is, is huge yeah so I, I just I got to have a sound horse there's no point yeah in spending two, three years developing this animal yeah. uh, and then when you finally get him to the point where he's jumping a metre 40, metre 50 and he breaks down on you. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. it's terrible. It's uh, gut-wrenching and it's also a massive imposition on your bank balance. Yeah. So um, they've got to be sound. And, yeah. and look, I, I think if there's one thing over the years, perhaps years ago, I'm not sure whether there was more sounder horses finishing their racing careers than today. Um, I think with the veterinary um, help and, and, and improvement over the years, the, the horses are definitely getting a lot more help, especially with injections in joints and things. Maybe yeah. we'll talk a bit more about that later. Yeah. Um, but they've got to be sound. So um, I'm definitely looking for that when they're on the lunge. Um, I guess the upside too... Um, with the with the lunging is that they show you a little bit more of their trainability more so than when you free jump because you've got this interaction a bit more interaction with them uh, you're having to maintain them on the circle um, and generally we, we're free jumping them without side oh sorry we're lunging them without side reins yeah. um, but if we can if I can use the side reins I'll use the side reins as well because it gives me a bit more of an, uh, an idea of their attitude to handling pressure contact yeah. So, uh, yeah. I don't know that I look. I've popped them over the a few little jumps in round yards on the lunge. That's it's it's useful. It's, it doesn't compare to the free jump though. Yeah. When it comes to uh, to finding out more though, it's probably when you move into that uh, ridden phase and when you do get onto them. Yep. Um, so let's talk about that next slide up there uh, and, and when it comes to riding them. So you look for the horse, you might have free jumped it, you might have put it on the lunge and uh, I suppose the true yep. test comes down to when you get in the saddle. Yep, absolutely. Um, so now we're on to rideability. So, um, and look, I can overlook a few things. You know, the, you don't expect them to come off out of their racing careers um, with the most soft, sensitive mouth. Um, but we can improve, we can train that. Um, the same with the ride ability. Um, I'm, I'm definitely looking for their attitude though. Um, you know, nappy horses, going to be a bit of hard work, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, you can, you can improve in that as well. There's no doubt about it. Um, but 
I love getting a horse off the track that has a nice balanced canter. Um, I've had plenty of good jumpers that don't have good canters, but they're a lot harder to ride. Yeah. Uh, so if you've got a nice light canter and a horse that can carry himself nicely, uh, it's going to be make your job a lot easier. So um, definitely looking for that. We and time, at the end of the day, too, when you jump, your whatever fence we're doing, going over poles, I want to feel that horse's desire to be careful, to be clean. Yeah, yeah that's it's something that you can't create. Yes. It's a God-given gift. It's so um, you know, we'll pop a few fences and. If, if they uh, start tapping too many rails and all that sort of thing, well, they're telling you that they're not going to be a top flight show jumper. Yeah. When you get a horse home, um, when you when you sort of, I guess, when, you, when you're free lunging them, is that something you do before you look at taking the horse on or is it sort of, um, do you get the horse home, kind of give it a little bit of a downtime and, and start free jumping? And, and at what point do you sort of start the riding aspect and, and sort of real, really kick it up a gear? Yeah, when I get them home, the first thing I'm doing is free jumping them. Um, if they've got any real major technical flaws or something there, it's look, it's it's just too hard. Um, there's so many really my my editors don't muck around with them. They're after something special. So and 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 all the good ones that I've had have shown you that ability very quickly. From the outside. Very quickly. Yeah. Um, so you know, and I'm getting older. I haven't got the time to mess around with them. I've if there's anything I've done wrong over my career, is I've spent too much time on average horses. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, honestly, don't yeah. don't do it, folks. That's that's if there's, I'd say that to my younger Russell. Just go for the really good ones. Yeah, when the, it comes um, to the, yeah, look, to it's, it's yeah. relative to what you can afford as well. Yeah, of course. When it comes to the right ability, so you get on them and uh, do you put them straight over a jump? Do you do a bit of flat work with them? What do you? Uh, what's your sort of first steps in terms of getting on them? Yeah, no, definitely. Look, I'll start with my flat work. Depends how long I've got before I have to make a decision on the horse. Um, if I've got to make a decision today, well, it's going to be, and I would just build a little grid, make it easy, drop hole in, one stride, one stride. You can soon get a good feel for the horse and, and look, the good ones will also give you a really powerful feel off the ground. I'm definitely looking for that. Um, so, you know, just definitely with the little grids. Um, the readability, that's something that's going to take time. So okay. so a simple grid, trot in, one stride, one stride. That'll soon give you a fair assessment. Yeah. Um, how important is it um, for having the right gear? Um, you are sponsored by Bates and, and you prefer to ride. Yeah, well, hang on. <laughs> what are your other hats? Here we go. <laughs> yes. Uh, talk to us about uh, how important that is to have the right gear. I guess, you, you know, as I yeah. said earlier, you want to give the horse the best opportunity and the bait saddle for you does that. It does. Look, I've been a big fan of baits over the years, not just because they're an Aussie-owned company, um, but they've been great value for me all uh, over the years and they've provided some super saddles. If when I go to look at horses, I always take my saddle. Um, it's it's gonna be some of the saddles we've had to contend with over the years. No, you don't want them. Uh, and I don't really want to jump in a jockey pad either. So I definitely take take my Victrix saddle, and uh, it keeps me in good stead because you need that. Look, the job's tough enough as it is without having poor equipment. So yeah. I definitely take my Victrix. Yeah, and the beauty of them too is like they're interchangeable with all the different builds of horses. So they've really got a great, they've got it happening nicely. So definitely take that one. Excellent. Um, now in terms of racing career, um, as we move through the slides here, um, what to, what sort of impact does a, a racing career have on you for a, for a show jumper? And what, 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 do you, what, what considerations, I guess, do you have to have um, as you're looking at, at thoroughbreds and, and what you're inheriting with them. Yeah, this look, this is a tough one. Um, look, the, generally, I always remember a piece of advice from a, a, a very astute vet once. He said, if a good racehorse starts to slow down, there's a reason. Um, generally, that reason soundness. Um, it's like any athlete's career, you know, like, 
I don't run as fast as I used to when I was 21. Yeah. Um, just can't do it. And uh, it's the same with the racehorse. Now, uh, so honestly, if I can get one that's done as few races as possible, I'm happy with it. Um, I mean, Southern Contrast, he, he only had three starts for three lasts. And he suited me just fine. Now, he also had some a racing injury that ended up coming back to bite us at, uh, at the end, um, which stopped him from performing to his absolute max when we got to the game. So, you know, that uh, it happens. But he could have done that bucking around in the paddock too. It's, it wasn't necessarily a racing injury. Pretty good racing, yeah. But, you know, the, the long term, the horses that have done a lot of starts, you've got to start wondering about their arthritic condition the joint, the condition of those joints, and yeah. it's uh, is it going to come back to bite me? So that's that's the number one concern. So any horse that I take on these days uh, is going to get X-rayed. Um, it's it's a no-brainer. I need to know where the joints are at. So I'm using my vet right from the start. I don't care whether that horse is going to cost me five thousand, five hundred, or twenty-five thousand. It's going to get X-rayed because you're going to spend three, four years of work on it uh, yeah. and you can't have it let you down. And some things you can't catch, you know, like slab fractures in knees, um, not uncommon with the gallopers. Like I've free jumped horses over the years and I would have taken those horses on. But luckily, you know, the trainers, look, this horse had a slab fracture in the knee. We re-X-rayed it and no, couldn't, couldn't go with it. So, you know, you can soon get caught out. Yeah, I think is what I'm sort of picking up is you're better off starting with the most close to p perfect horse possible. Nothing's perfect, but as close as you can, eliminating as many of those, uh, you know, things that are going to come back to bite you, as you said, uh, early on and as early yeah. as you can to give yourself the best. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually quite don't mind naughty horses either. Horses that were the racetrack and were misbehaving, um, you know, that... that played up or a bit inclined to buck or something going to the stalls or that type of thing they those horses are getting sacked because they're misbehaving they're not getting sacked because they've got a soundness issue yeah. um so I, i'm more than happy to have a look at those um don't know about a shiitake though if, <laughs> if he stops in the stalls um i think we had one of those at the pentathlon last night didn't we <laughs> oh, I didn't watch that, but I'm definitely going back to watch oh, it. Back to all the comments that I heard. Oh, that girl. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't pull the horse out. Actually, you know, like, yeah. but you know, yeah, the, the one thing about when you look at a competition just on the television like that, you don't actually see how they warmed up and whether that horse got a fright in the warm up. And and unfortunately for the pantathletes too, they're riding those horses after somebody else has been out competing them too. So uh, yeah. Yeah, it was quite disappointing. So maybe Shatak or my, I don't think I would have been real keen. <laughs> you never know. Talking about the pentathlon, in, in uh, doing a bit of research on you, Russell, um, I did note that you've uh, you've been involved with some pentathletes. I have. I coached both the pentathletes for the Sydney Olympics. Um, and uh, look, I have the utmost respect for them. They, they work so hard uh, and they're doing such skill sports that don't really with each other you know like pistol shooting it's a skill on its own i mean show jump riding is a massive skill on its own yeah um i guess the running and swimming you got the cardiovascular but then the swimming is a big technique thing um and then fencing Woof. they're not they're not the sort of athlete you want to get out with you know because you can't run from them they'll shoot you <laughs> and if you get up close they've got a sword <laughs> and they can swim really well. So I, I really stayed in good terms with my pentathletes. I still do. Yeah. No, they, they are just, they work so hard. I, I just take my hat off to them. And, yeah, I, my heart went out to that poor girl last night when that horse didn't go. But by the same token, like I say, you didn't, we didn't get to see how it warmed up. And, yeah. and warming a horse up for an event is, um, is a major skill in itself. Mm. Now, with uh, Brisbane being announced uh, in a few years' time, Russell, you're a good show jumper. How are you going at uh, swimming, running, uh, fencing yourself? <laughs> <you> there? <laughs> now, well, I shoot well, but I swim like a rock. I just go <laughs> straight down. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to cross country run, but no, no, no. That time has truly passed. Uh, I just simply couldn't swim. I've just, I, I, I'm in awe of what those swimmers can do. I'm much better with four legs underneath me. Speaking of uh, of which, a, a, a four horse, four legged animal, a horse. Southern contrast. Back in 1996, we touched on it earlier. Atlanta Olympics. Yep. Um, talk to us about this horse, the New Zealand bred horse who raced as contrast. Uh, tell us yep. the story. He was about actually Australian bred. Australian bred. He was actually okay. Australian bred, but he was born in New Zealand. So his mother, when I was exported to New Zealand with him in utero, there was uh, back in that time there were massive tax advantages for importing um, a mare twelve months old, twelve years old plus could be fully to tax deducted in twelve months in New Zealand. So it was a huge bonus to the. New Zealand racing industry, and that's how he ended up over there. So, how did it, how did it come about that you, uh, you ended up with him? Was he uh, did he race in New Zealand uh, with his three stars? No. He started over there. No, he he raced here in Australia. Um, he was actually imported to Australia with a a New Zealand uh, a former New Zealand trainer who was now based in down the road from me actually, uh, and one of his staff rang me up and said, look. We've got this horse here. He's a nice horse. He's good temperament. Um, he'd been out, and this particular trainer also took his horses out uh, doing a little bit of hunting as fitness work. So the horse had been jumped by his daughter and had shown a, 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 a really good attitude to it all. And uh, so that's how I ended up. They brought the horse down. Uh, we gave him a free jump, and uh, that got my interest, and um, that's how he ended up here. Well, and then when I had a ride on him, the first time yeah. I rode him, it was just a, a lovely super light canter and 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 uh, and I thought at the time at the time he, he actually free jumped, he went that fast, he never really showed me great technique with his back legs. Um, and I, I my first World Cup horse that I had at the time was uh, very good in front but poor with his technique behind and he had no scope. And uh, I didn't particularly want another one, so I, I Really wanted one with scope, but my um, my dealer hat was on at the time, and I thought, well, if this horse doesn't make it as a show jumper, he had a bit of he had nice movement, um, and he was certainly bold with his jumping, so he's more likely could make an eventer if he didn't go on as a show jumper. But uh, it didn't take us long to realise that he he had a pretty good show jumping career ahead of him. Yeah. Uh, when you did get to Atlanta, how did you go? What was it? You mentioned uh, earlier that the, the time factor is, is very different these days. Um, the, the course is a lot tighter. What was it like? Uh, what was show jumping 96 like? Well, it was tough. Um, and every Olympics, they always seem to come up with something different, um, whether it be a particular jump or whatever's happening there. And, and like, there's, there's no shortage of pressure um, there. Yeah. And, and uh, look, and I was the worst part about it was I was still learning how to ride the horse at that level uh, when I got to the games. Um, I would love to have had another go four, year, four years later because uh, I learned a hell of a lot more. And, um, and I'd love to have that horse again and have another go because I'm a way better rider now than, uh, or at least I think I am, than what I was then. Um, and I'm certainly a better trainer. Um, so, yeah, I was still learning and you have to keep it in context for where you're at in your career. And I was, uh, it, 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 I love the story where Jao Palu got eliminated at Los Angeles and came back and won the gold medal at Seoul four years later. I would love to have uh, had a crack at that one. Have so, it was a learning experience. And yeah. it's the pressure of the whole thing as well, you know, like, and my first round, I had had a hiccup with my warm up, and that didn't go so well. And I was pretty relieved to get around the first course, actually. So, yeah, yeah, you learn learning. absolutely. And I, I guess that's the thing with horses too; we never stop learning. Uh, so the beauty of hindsight—that's right. It, things could have been different, but uh, I guess it is what it is. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you've also competed in the Hicks said Derby. Uh, I mentioned before it's infamous. It's quite a quite a competition, isn't it? What was that like, and uh, what horse did you compete there with? Yeah, that was Southern Contrast. Um, I actually look back at it, and sometimes I think oh, I shouldn't have done it because he sustained an injury coming off 
Well, I think he sustained the injury coming off the bank. He was a bit sore afterwards, and I think I flared up his old um, early racing career injury. Uh, so, you know, in hindsight, probably shouldn't have done it, but it was one of those once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. Um, we'd, I'd been to the uh, Royal International Horse Show, and the whole Aussie team after the tour in 95 was at Hickstead, and uh, he came fourth in the King George Gold Cup, and that gave me automatic entry into the Derby, so I didn't have to do any qualifications. And as far as I was concerned, and it probably will be that way, I thought, well, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I better take it. Um, so, and I'd got a job driving a truck for a Japanese rider back over in uh, Holland, um, was teed up by one of the grooms on our team, luckily. And um, so I was going, I went back over to Hank Nuren's stable where the Japanese guy was based. I didn't even know who Hank Nuren was, let alone that he was one of the best trainers in the world. So I really fell on my feet there and they were fantastic people. And, and look, honestly, some people talk about the horse world. Well, I reckon the horse world is just fantastic people by far the majority of truly awesome. Like yeah. if you've got the attitude to be able to work with animals and train animals, it's a certain personality. And um, there are very, I think the horse people by and large are, are fantastic people all around the world doesn't matter what language they speak. Um, and I must say, I've, everywhere I've gone uh, throughout Europe and uh, that tour, the horse people have just really looked after us really well. And, and Hank Nuren Stable was, was right up the top. They're just superb. And, um, but I will say the, the one thing about being in Europe back then was with a limited budget is that I was relying on other people to get me to shows. So um, that was the whole deal with the Japanese guy was to... Uh, put my horse on the truck and go to the shows that he was going to. Yeah. Um, and then he didn't come back to Hanks and everything sort of got messed up. And then I had a, uh, Hank had a, um, a Canadian rider come over who was going to the French Championships. So I ended up driving the truck for her and putting my horse on it and I ended up at the French Championships. So <laughs> that was like, how the hell did we get there, you know? <laughs> and uh, the storming up at the French Championships. I went to a boarding school in Brisbane at the Maris Brothers in boarding school. And uh, I, in those days, we had to do French in year eight. And I, I remember thinking, what the hell do I need French for? I'm never going to France. <laughs> and uh, yeah, sorry, brother, you were right. I should have listened to those lessons. <laughs> How did yeah, your, French help. Your, your French wasn't up to scratch, I take it? Uh, on the trois, that's about it, yeah. <laughs> Super play. So, <laughs> Uh, I even went in the ring in the wrong order. That's how bad it was. But um, but I, I actually didn't. I went there to qualify for to to do the the derby. So like I practiced doing the derby before Hickstead, the bank, to do the bank before Hickstead, and I actually qualified for the derby, but ended up in the Grand Prix instead. And he only had one rail down in the, the Grand Prix, the French Championship. So it was a fantastic show. The French crowds are unbelievable they really understand the sport and get behind it and i don't think i want to be a french rider at a french show though they really put some pressure on their riders oh yeah they start cheering and clap and send the horse around the course halfway around the course they make it tough but uh, i went to hickstead and i my horse had never even been down a bank that's how poorly prepared i was so uh, i can't believe how brave that contrast was to actually go down the bank but yeah. um to do Hickstead, you, the bank, you really need to get from the bottom of the bank it's about a half strides to a metre 65 uh, vertical. And to jump that, you really need to get about half to two thirds down the bank, push off the bank, yeah. get the two strides. And my guy just had no idea that there was a, a jump coming up. And they need to learn to know that there's a jump coming up after the bank. All he was worried about was getting off that bank and staying yeah. on his feet. So, yeah, yeah. It, it was an experience, but it was tough. And, you know, to do also the Devil's Dyke and all that sort of thing, they're courses that we just don't do in Australia. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I still can't believe how brave that horse was to go around. We ended up having a few rails down, but he completed. And uh, not many can say that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, another horse that you yeah. had um, as we move through the slides here, uh, Dasha. Um, talk to us about this horse. Yes. Well, Dasha was probably the most successful racehorse 
that um, that I've competed on. Dash Dash won the Sydney Cup way back in 1995. Um, just a super athlete. Um, he'd finished his career. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember how many starts he had, um, uh, but he did starts, he had plenty of starts. About forty, I think. Yeah, forty-four starts. Yeah, about forty for starts. Yeah, he came. Different. Phenomenal horse. He came second in seven Group One races. You know, like, and he only got beat by like a half a head or a neck. Or if he'd have just picked up a couple of those, he'd have finished with a massive amount of prize money. Um, and look, to be honest with you, I. How much? How sound was he? Couldn't completely answer that one. Um, and I think over the years that the advancements in, in even in x-rays today, like back in those days, to take an x-ray, you had to get a plate done, um, get the plate, take it back to the clinic, produce it. And if the plate, if the x-ray wasn't real good, then you had to come back and vet yeah. it again. And these digital x-rays today, they just, they've changed the game. Um, they've made it so much easier and quicker and better. Um, to analyze where the horses are at. But Dash, Dash was, um, he was a super horse. He was a really good athlete. Um, atmosphere probably got to him a little bit. Um, you know, he's I often think Dash, Dash was a really cool horse, but he, he went like from first gear to second gear and then straight into top gear. He sort of missed out on gear three and four. He could, we could have done with those some. Yeah, um, and he just jumped a little bit, but he jumped part three. He, he placed for us part three at Adelaide Royal, and uh, the owners they just adored him, and they actually loved coming to the shows with him. They they had more to do with him in his show jumping career than they ever did with his racing career. So uh, yeah, no, he's a it was a really good horse, um, and again, he had a good temperament, um, which was a huge bonus to make him more rideable. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. Now, with the uh, the purpose bred warm bloods, what place do you see the thoroughbreds playing sort of going forward? Is it like you mentioned about um, you know all the the veterinary help that these horses have on the track and, and coming off the track? Yeah. Is it harder to find a good horse? Are we more critical of thoroughbreds when they're coming off the track now? Um, what's your experience in terms of that? Yeah, look, I think we know more now. That's that's <laughs> that's a big thing, um, and the the ability to analyse where they're at. Um, is is uh, is improved a heck of a lot, and it, for me, it's it's as a professional, um, I've got to make a living out of it, and we don't make much prize money in this country. The, the mm. prize money is really, really small comparatively to other the powers around the world. So yeah. you know, we really we're also relying on being able to sell that horse in three, four, five years time. Um, and if they don't pass the vet check, they're not going to be sold. So, you know, that's that's the long-term goal as well. Uh, they've got to be able to be, they've got to stay sound to be able to do the job. And then they've got to be able to pass the vet check to be uh, marketable at the end. So um, the vetting is huge. It really is. In fact, I think you've got Rowan uh, doing part of this with the, with the vetting. So I have a very good relationship with my vets. Yeah. Excellent. For those people that might be um, for looking for a horse off the track uh, as a potential show jumper, what are some words of advice for you? Yeah. Get the horse vetted. Um, it costs the same amount to feed a good horse as a not so good horse. What what else can you yeah. offer some advice? Yeah. And look, it all depends where you're at in your career as well. Um, look, I, I I know that it's there's no good. If I'd have had Southern Contrast when I started in my career, I'd have wrecked him. I would have frightened that horse and and it would have destroyed him. So, you know, the when you're starting out, you don't want something too careful. Um, you, you really need something that's way more forgiving and a little braver. Um, so it, it's a different type of horse. So the three important things to be looking for when you're starting out is temperament, temperament, and temperament. It's really, you know, that, that important um, because, you know, it, it, you can make mistakes, and that horse has got to help you out a little bit. So you don't want something that's too spooky, um, too careful, and, you know, if you, you've got a huge jump, well, it, it's going to be hard to sit on. So, um, no, you get, get something with a good temperament, 
and a good attitude to the jumping. You don't want something too spooky. Yeah. And the other thing that that's, it doesn't hurt is to um, try and see whether they're actually horse shy. You know, the gallopers are always galloping with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to the shows in the warm-ups and all of a sudden there's horses coming at them. It's yeah. a whole new experience where you're off the tracker. So it's gonna, it, it doesn't hurt to spend a bit of time and get a friend and go on a circle uh, and have them going in the opposite direction and just acclimatise that horse to having horses coming at him. So, but temperament's the big one when you're starting out and then you can slowly start to do your, your feet into the water for getting something that's a bit more careful uh, and a little bit trickier to ride, but um, it's going to jump more clean rounds. Excellent. Well, Russell, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great uh, learning more about show jumping and, and your mind. Congratulations, as I said earlier, on your success to date. No doubt we'll be seeing lots more of you in the future and uh, it's been fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. I hope so. Thanks very much, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure and good luck to everybody out there and uh, go the thoroughbreds. So Toro Gianti came to me in November last year. He'd uh, finished racing 18 months ago due to injury. So Tori probably wasn't seen as um, something that was particularly appealing to, to someone straight off the track. Um, that's the great thing about the reset program. It really does show that these horses still have so much to offer in their post-racing careers. He arrived here and he was in absolutely fantastic order. Part of the ownership group was the breeders. Um, so he could have sat at their property in a lap of luxury, but being only eight years old, they really felt that he had so much more to offer. Um, so yeah, they put a lot of time and effort into rehabbing him. And yeah, he, he was just ready to go on with. He didn't really understand anything other than being a racehorse, so it was really ba basically starting from scratch and teaching him the very basics of flat work. So he's picked it up really well. He's a very trainable horse. He's a very sensible horse. So he's been a real delight and a pleasure to train. He's a really big horse, but having said that, he's very much the gentle giant. He has a lot of presence about him, Tori. He really has lovely movement covers the ground beautifully so I could really see him um, whether it's in a dressage arena, a show arena, HRCAV or just simply a pleasure horse for someone to enjoy. He really does have a lovely temperament and really super easy to do anything with. Tori's now finished his retraining, he's good to go, he's ready to go to that next stage so he's actually now just been recently advertised and so it's now my job to try and find him the perfect partner to go on with him. It's something I can't help. I get an emotional um, connection to these horses and so when his new family and friends are found, there'll certainly be tears. Amanda Ross is an Australian Olympic eventing rider who, along with her thoroughbred Otto Schumacher, competed in the individual three-day event competition and finished a very credible 20th in front of a home crowd in 2000. Since then, Amanda's career at the top has continued with great success, including a number of selections as reserved for the World Equestrian Games. Last year, Amanda was crowned the EV Eventing Rider of the Year, with her horse, Coco Poppin Candy, awarded the 2020 Racing Victoria Off the Track Dressage Horse of the Year. With her sights set on Tokyo 2020 for the powerhouse combination, it wasn't to be, with Amanda announcing the retirement of her long-term eventing partner, Zazi, due to soundness issues. Dare I say, we haven't seen the last of Amanda, though, as she searches for her next superstar, and we learn more about what Amanda finds important in choosing the perfect off-the-track thoroughbred. Amanda, thanks for joining us for this Masterclass. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was quite the welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me. I, I did a little bit of research on you. 2000 Olympics. It's very timely right now. Olympics happening on TV. Brisbane coming up in a few years' time. It must have, for you, it must sort of take you back to 2000. What a year, if any, to compete at an Olympics in front of a home crowd. What was that like? Um, well, it's the, the games that I did, um, that's the only one that I can compare it to. And so I think um, now when I look back on that, I think that it's, that was an incredibly amazing opportunity. Um, I think you do have a home ground advantage because you don't have to travel. Um, there's no language barrier. You pretty much 
leave home a, a lot later compared to everybody else. And you will probably have um, a lot more of your crew available, even though, you know, accreditation is quite strict in the games itself. But, you know, your, ha your family will, will be around the place and e yeah. easy to contact. So it's, um, it is a lot different to, say, Tokyo this time where there's been, you know, minimal crew, no spectators, mm -hmm. no family. Like it's been really military this time instead. So, um, but it's still the Olympics. Yeah. What's it like riding out in front of that sort of crowd? Is it something you, you know, obviously with Tokyo and, and we'll talk to, about uh, about Zazi a little bit later on, but um, so is that something that drives you all the time to compete at that top level? Yeah, it is. It is. I think, um, you know, I really like to compete where, I don't know, I really like to push myself as much as I can and it's very strategic. Um, it's very challenging. There's a big sense of achievement, I think, to um, be able to push myself to that level. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's just something that's naturally happened and then I just have that drive to keep doing it. <laughs> Yeah. Whether that's a good thing or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it keeps you going, I guess. So that's it is a yeah. good thing. Now, um, I mentioned in the intro that Otto Schumacher was a thoroughbred, didn't uh, mm -hmm. didn't race as far as I know. Uh, mm -hmm. You've also had lots of success with other thoroughbreds, and of course, um, Zazi, uh, Coco mm -hmm. Poppy Candy, also a thoroughbred. Um, talk to us a bit about uh, your time with thoroughbreds, and and um, we'll go through the, the slides in just a moment. But I guess an overall snapshot of, of how you find the thoroughbreds for what you choose to do. Okay. Well, um, I like majority of Australian riders that are in my vintage. Um, the thoroughbred off the track was always the horse that you ended up with. So um, I, once I was tall enough, which, you know, I'm not very tall, but tall enough to get off ponies. Um, I think it, when I was 13, I got my first sort of 15 two hand thoroughbred. Um, and it wasn't the best, it wasn't the best choice in that first 12 months to put a 13 year old kid on a fairly green <laughs> five year old thoroughbred. But I must say, after 12 months, we solidified our relationship and she was a wonderful, wonderful horse. So I have had so many thoroughbreds off the track and spent a lot of time hanging out at country race meets, looking at, you know, the nice types and wondering if they'd come last and making relationships and with, um, you know, the, the local trainers and seeing if I can put tabs on horses. So uh, yeah, I feel like I have had a lot to do with the off the track thoroughbred. Hmm. Well, we might move through the, the slides and the first one of them, Star Treat. Tell us a bit, bit about this horse uh, by Fantastic Light out of Lollies. Talk to us about, uh, about Star Treat. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got uh, a mare. This, obviously, this mare's got a little bit of age on her now, but um, looking at her, um, I'm going to look at her obviously as an eventer, to choose an eventer. Yep. Um, so w looking, if I was buying a show hack, I think that it would be a lot easier to pick a horse from a photo because the show hack predominantly is there to be stunning and beautiful and to have straight legs and to be, you know, a model. Whereas the eventer, the one thing that they need the most of is heart and you can't find that on a picture. So I just have to add that at the start. Absolutely. I, yeah. Now, this horse as a mare, we look at it and I like to balance them in sections. So I look at them in three parts, the head and neck, the shoulder, and then the hind quarter. Um, and with eventers, they've got to have, they've got to have scope. They've got to have a good stride. They've got to have um, a good lung capacity. They have to do a lot of things. They have to move well. They have to be athletic and sharp. They have to jump well. Um, and so soundness is a huge part. So if I first of all, look at this horse and I want to look at the overall picture and I want to divide it into three pieces. Um, if I look at her, I think that she she does have three equal parts. So she's not too long or too short in the neck. She's got a nice big shoulder, which I like, which gives her more reach in her forearm. Um, and she's probably a little weaker behind um, the behind the saddle. So and maybe her hind quarter could be a little bit um, more muscled, but she's also a mare and you know how mares sometimes are a little bit longer than yeah. um, their gilding counterparts. Um, she looks like she has a very kind eye and um, is standing in a very relaxed fashion. And so that's another big thing if the horse seems to have a good temperament because they've got to be trainable. Um, she looks to have, even though she's got lots of boots on in the front, uh, in the picture with the tack on, that's the, the picture I can get a better look at her legs she looks to have straight legs. Um, what I do see here is that we've got four white socks and she's got the little black ermine marks. And I think it looks like she's got black feet or white feet. I think they're black, which is wow. great. So yep. 
um, thoroughbred feet, um, because they're having their plates changed all the time and they're being shod really often, um, sometimes we find that they come and they're a little bit flat. So strength of hoof is really, really important. And the more white hoof you get in there, often the weaker the foot can be. And then, you know, the last thing we want to do is pull a shoe because then that can affect their soundness if they take some of the hoof off. Um, you know, so strong feet are really important. Um, length of reign wise, so kind eye, nice sized head, um, nice demeanor, neck um, comes out of the shoulder with a good length, possibly a, a fraction low. Um, and for the eventing, because we've got the dressage element, they need to be able to sit up into a frame. Um, but in saying that, you know, she's not, um, that just could be the way she's standing. She might be just, you know, a little laid back. Um, but yeah, as I said, nice big shoulder. I really like that. Good chest, um, good depth from her wither to below the girth. Um, and she's standing square enough, like not dead square, but she looks like she is balanced when she stands. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so she looks like a really pleasant horse. I think that it would be as it, I can't pick any of these horses unless I see them move as well and see their athleticism yeah. and their straightness and their soundness and stuff. But um, she looks like a pleasant, a pleasant horse that is well balanced and could make a nice all rounder actually. Yeah. yeah. So if you found a horse like this, what uh, what would be the next steps? So somebody sent you a photo. You've sort of, kind of mm -hmm. yeah, this is this is you know it might be close by. It's not a not a lot of effort mm -hmm. to go and have a look at it. What might you do yep. from here? Okay, so if it's not close by, I will ask for a video. Um, but the, the ideal amount of footage would be um, a video of the horse walking directly away from me at the walk and directly back to me in the walk. Then the same thing in the trot, straight away, straight back. And I'm looking for straightness in the movement and soundness um, and straightness in the legs as well. And the reason um, I'm looking for straightness in the legs is for soundness. So there's a yeah. few bits and pieces. If they have a splint, for example, and the splint sits forward on the bone, it's not sitting back towards the suspensory and it's a, a well solidified splint, it's not fresh, it's not active. I don't mind that, yeah. you know, that's yeah. not such a drama. Um, yeah. And we put boots on them when we jump them anyway. So um, it's not a blemish that's a problem. Um, and I then like to see them free lunged. So big, long rain, you know, walk, trot, canter on the lunge. So I can see how they carry themselves naturally in both directions without a rider on their back, as well as soundness. Um, and when you look at them on the lunge, you can see them going, turning and coming back. So you see them trotting towards you, trotting away from you. Um, and then if they're ridden, it's good to see them under saddle. But if this horse was straight off the track, um, I don't necessarily need to see it ridden just on the lunge is enough um and if it was possible to jump it i'd love to see it jump and it you know can just start over poles and then gradually make them a bit bigger and i'm looking to see what sort of a technique and a style it has how brave it is um and um yeah if i think that it's got potential for the jumping Right. With the um, with the elements, the three elements of eventing, what mm -hmm. what do you kind of think is the most important? Or in terms of that, is it the jumping? Is it the is it the dressage? Where do you kind of what what's the most important element? I guess that you're looking for in that in that thoroughbred. Um, look, they are all important. Um, mm. they out of the three phases, two of them are jumping. So the horse needs to be a good jumper, and by a good jumper, it doesn't have to be as amazing and sharp as a show jumper but it needs to at least get its forearm yep. up it can't yep. jump with its knee down um yep. because that makes it a much safer jumper um and to be honest if you want to ask me something overall it really needs to be sound because it's a very tough sport and yep. i tend not to take on horses that have had any form of injury um, or soundness issue because it's going to end up as an eventer it'll get them in the end at the level that i'm looking for yeah yeah. yeah. Um, when you if you were to go look at a horse and, and it sort of tick the boxes, do you always get a vet check? Is that something you're always adamant for? For me, it is for me definitely. Um, and look, I think there's reasons for vet checks. Um, for me, buying a younger horse and wanting to bring it on in a sport that's going to be quite physically taxing on it, I really want to make sure the horse is starting from the best place possible. Um, if I find a horse that ticks all the boxes and it's for, say, a less experienced rider, but it has a couple of soundness issues, if they're manageable, I don't mind. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. if it's a windsucker, but it holds its weight and it's a good doer and it doesn't affect it. You know, if it's safe, if it's sound, if it's honest, if it's a great horse, there's lots of things that I can negotiate on. Yeah. 
Horses for courses. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, we might move through then um, to the first of the, uh, the off the track thoroughbreds that you've got here, yep. OTT yep. one, I guess. Um, talk to us about this horse, a five-year-old gelding by Written Tycoon. Yeah. Okay. So we, we've got two shots of him here, and I'm not sure if they're taken. You know how far apart they're taken. Mm -hmm. um, on the left hand side, possibly if that was when he was out of racing because he's wearing a rearing bit and no boots. Um, looks like a nice horse. I like his eye, and uh, you know he's got quite an intelligent head. And in the first shot there, I really like the way I like sort of that his neck comes out of his head a little bit. Uh, sorry, his neck comes out of his shoulder a little bit higher. Um, yes. He has straight legs. And he looks like he's got well-balanced feet. And I'm looking, in, in terms of well-balanced feet, I'm looking for that angle from the Paston, um, Pastons through to the foot. Um, and if the thoroughbreds get the slightly fat, flat foot, then it ends up um, them being a little bit uh, too much angle in the Paston and then too much strain down the back of the tendon. So that's why their feet have to be really well-maintained. Um, he looks in the first photo, the left-hand side photo, really great shine to his coat, really healthy. Um, Good length of rain, nice, nice enough slope on the sh uh, shoulder. Possibly you want a little bit more slope on the shoulder with this guy. So the steeper the slope of the shoulder, I think the choppier the movement can be. Um, but he looks to have quite a nice hind quarter. And by that, I mean, he's got a good angle from the top of his hip back to the point of his butt um, just below his tail. And to me, if they've got that good angle, it means they've, good, they've got quite a good length of stride behind as well. Um, if I then look at that fellow um, on the right-hand side photo, it looks like he's done a little bit of work. Um, and we've got a clear shot of all of his legs. He does look like he's got four good feet and that's promising. So he's got four solid feet, nothing like a soup plate where they, or dinner plate where they start to spread. Um, he's yep. got a really good, I actually think he has got a good bum, this horse. Got a nice solid hind quarter. Um, he has, his legs, his hind legs are good sometimes he might sometimes he looks a bit straight from the, his hip straight like from the back point of his bum straight down to his hock but i actually think that i'd prefer that to a longer second yeah. thigh i think that is yeah. um i think i prefer that slightly shorter hind leg especially for jumping horses um but he again the only thing i could pick here was that maybe a little steep in the shoulder but again neck comes out of the shoulder quite well nice disposition Good straight legs, very important, good feet. And he actually looks like a leggy fellow. So I think he could be an elegant horse. Yeah. So I think that yeah. that real, sorry, I was going to say that yeah. English type of thoroughbred that's that leggy and tall yeah. and has a good length of rain. That's that's perfect for me. Yeah. Um, this horse has raced 14 times. In terms mm -hmm. of uh, racing career and, and the impact that might have on them, is that something you take into consideration or do you consider the overall soundness if you were to get a vet check? Um, to the down the track. Um, bit, bit of both, really. Bit of both. Um, if it has a fabulous vet check, but it's raced 40 times, I mean, I don't really know these days what we call a horse that's raced heaps and what's not, because most of the ones I get haven't raced very much at all because they're awful. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, if it's got a really clean bill of health, I think too, if they have raced a lot and they've got a clean bill of health, they must be pretty tough. Yeah. So that can be a tick in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then sometimes I think, look, if they haven't raced a lot, um, I do actually like when they do a prep as a young horse because I think it hardens up their body a lot too. So um, they have the fact they've done something to me is is um, it's a good thing. Makes them wiser too when you start with them. Is there an ideal age that you like to get them off the track? This one, five year old. Yeah, he's a good age. Yeah, he's a good age. I think four, five, maybe a six year old, depending. Um, I actually know of a really nice six-year-old that a friend of mine's got and she won't sell it for another 12 months because it's a jumps horse and it's outstanding. But I think it's one of those horses, as a six-year-old, you know, it's developed uh, a frame that goes on the flat really nicely, like as a, it does quite a nice dressage. Um, it's got a great attitude. It's a jumps horse, so it's seen a whole heap. I wish I could pick yeah. it off her. So I might not get that to a <laughs> seven-year-old if I can convince her. <laughs> so you so, want yeah, to accept a seven-year-old. So four, five, six, maybe seven. <laughs> maybe seven, but because it's come from her and I know it's done some flat work and it's established already in the you know direction I want. Yeah, yeah, we could we could have that. <laughs> yeah. Now, if this horse is what it's currently spelling, um, what's what was your what's your usual timeline with a horse like this off the track? Do you give it some more time to spell? Would you get a horse home like this and and see its potential first, and then perhaps move it on if it's not the right sort of horse, or would you give it some time? Mm -hmm. um, I generally like to get to know them a little bit before I 
turn them out. So if they've come to me and they uh, they have been in work or they're sound and there's no reason not to work them, um, I like to handle them a little bit and I always start by a bit of groundwork and lunging because I don't know them and I want yeah. to see how they move on their own. I want to see what sort of attitude they've got, what learnings they have, what stuff we need to train them, teach them that's going to be different, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the different life they're about to start. Um, and often I just like to tick a few boxes before if I think they need a spell. So that's give them a bit of work so they're familiar with the property so they don't run around and go, oh, my God, I'm somewhere new yeah. and hurt themselves. Um, yeah. Establish some basics so that they understand the kind of behaviours that are expected of them and they're comfortable with that. Work out what sort of temperament I think they've got. Um, and if I think, look, you know, it's, it's probably not going to be for me, then at least then if I do a little bit of basic work on it, I can then recommend it to someone who I think it is going to suit or at least say to someone, I think it's got these positives. I don't think it's going to be this kind of horse. You know, go to the right home. Yeah. Excellent. Um, let's move through to off the track number two. Quite a pretty mm -hmm. front, uh, pretty face horse, this mm -hmm. one. Um, mm -hmm. A four-year-old gelding by um, the sorry, Dundee Eel. Mm -hmm. Eight time, uh, it, the horse raced eight times. Uh, talk to us about what you think of this horse. Okay, I like this one a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. This actually, of all the horses here, was the one that took my eye. And um, I kind of looked at it and I thought, what, what is it that, that stands out about this horse, first of all? So, I mean, A, it's a great picture and he's in amazing condition. So he's got a beautiful shine to his coat. The thing that draws me in, first of all, is he's got a magnificent shoulder, a beautiful slope to his shoulder, which means he's going to have more reach in his forearm. Um, the left-hand side picture, he's got a stunning neck. So his neck comes beautifully out of his shoulder. It's not too low and it's got a really nice arch to it. So um, for us with the dressage, we want the horse to be round. And if they have a slightly hollow neck, it means that job is harder. Um, he's, got, he's got a good looking head. Look, to be honest, if the horse is not that attractive in the head, but it's great in the body and it's sound and it does a good job for eventing, it doesn't matter if it's pretty, I can put a shiny brow band and a bigger nose band on it. It doesn't worry. It's not when you've got to um, feed it over the stable if it's pretty every day. <laughs> yeah, well, this is it. I mean, it's a bonus if they're pretty, but useful is what I'm after. Absolutely. Um, useful, honest and sound. Um, so, yeah, so this guy, beautiful front, lovely arch to the neck, um, lovely big shoulder. He looks quite wide in the chest too. Um, he's obviously very fit and he's got matching shoulders and hindquarter. So from the top of his bum back to the, the slope behind his um, point of his bottom near his tail, he's got a lovely big slope. So he looks like he's going to be equal in front and behind. Um, leg wise, he looks very straight. Can't really see his feet that well, um, but he looks like he has four matching legs, nice size joints. Um, yep, I'll take him, thanks. <laughs> They're the next one for you. And he's a good age. He's four. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there anything about this horse that you 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 don't like? Um, you know, with the, what what if you were being critical? What were the things if you said that's probably something I'm not loving? Not really, to be Pretty honest. Happy. No, yeah. Unless I saw him move, um, I'd have to see him move. Yeah. Yeah. So if he if he had you know. Uh, if, he, if he raised his head a little bit and, and travelled with a slightly head carriage and hollowed his back a little bit and looked like he wasn't going to really drop his head, like the first photo, he looks really promising like that. Yep. Um, yeah, it's all up to how this horse moves now because on picture he looks super. Um, I'd also have to see him behind as well, make sure that he had an even hindquarter so that he wasn't a little bit higher one side than the other. But And obviously if he can't see him in front, we can't see the straightness of his legs going up and down. But his side on picture is very pleasing. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, let's move through to the next slide here. I've got a, another gelding, mm -hmm. this one by Del Zayo, uh, winner at yeah. Sandown uh, and mm -hmm. at Sale, uh, mm -hmm. part of uh, RV's reset program. This one is uh, mm -hmm. retrained and rehomed. Um, talk to us about this horse and what you think. I'm going to take this one to the show ring straight away um, <laughs> because it is a beautiful stamp, I think, just as it is. Um, it's obviously, it's in beautiful condition. It's got pretty enough head. Nice length of rein, beautifully. It comes out of the shoulder really nicely. It's got a great arch to it. The shoulder is super balanced with the hind quarter. Um, it's a lovely compact horse. So this horse is, in a sense, a better performance type than the previous one because it looks like, as an eight-year-old, I'm yes. assuming it's, it looks like it's done more as a performance yeah, horse than it's in a maturity. performance horse shape and muscle. Yeah, and condition. Yeah. Um, it looks like it's got really quite straight legs. Hard to tell about the feet. 
but it stands with a leg at each corner. Um, it, yeah, this is a lovely, lovely horse and it looks like one that you could hop on straight away and um, go into the show ring and, yeah, it's really nice. It's really nice. Yeah. Um, with these horses, what uh, when you get a horse, do you generally, if you find that it does have the potential, um, you've done a little bit of work on it, you've put it back out in the paddock, do you sort of generally set it up for a time frame or do you sort of bring it back in and then go, okay, let's see what we've got and, and keep ticking along? Um, or do I have a set sort of pattern of work with them or expectation? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It depend no, not really. It depends on the horse. I think there's things that I would like them to be able to do and however long it takes them to do those, they're all different. Um, so there'll be certain basic exercises like I want them to be able to really turn right and turn left and to be able to teach them to move their hind legs over, their middle over, their front over, like try to teach them the different aids um, from all over their body. And um, they often, when they come off the track, they've learnt walk, a bit of trot, and then into canter. Yeah. So um, I've just got to take the time to teach them that their body is now compartmentalised. And yes. when yeah. they get that, then all of a sudden things become a lot easier for them. So there's no hurry for that. Yeah. There's no hurry at all. Yeah. I don't think yeah. you can hurry them because you, you can't hurry learning. <laughs> Yeah, true that. Uh, now, the mm -hmm. last horse we've got here, five-year-old uh, Gelding by Fiorante. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about this one? A couple of very different shots of this horse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that the progression from, obviously, the bottom shot is when he when he came and the top shot is when he's, after he's done a, um, a bit of a prep um, as a performance horse. And I think that it's a, it's a very interesting transformation um, and he looks fantastic. I really think he does. Um, if I look at him in the top shot, I think the they've done a great job. He does have a very good length of rein, and with the work and the way he stood up there, it looks like he's got more top line. You can see the bottom one. Um, that sort of neck to me, you'd have to see when you looked at him how he travelled with that neck because yeah. some of their necks I find they can have a good length of rein, but they could go either way. They could get a little hollow or you could start creating good top line. And that comes down to being well produced, you know, having yeah. a good and Based a good on that top photo, he has actually, he, he does, is able to carry himself better with the amount of work that he's had and created that shape. Isn't he? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think in that that top shot where he's um, he's got a lovely slope to his shoulder, he's got good condition, um, you know, his hind quarter, he's got a bit of a bump on the top there, but compared to the bottom photo, he's got a lot more top line to support um, his shape. And he looks, again, I can't see his legs too much. He looks to have straight legs. He does have the white feet. Um, and so that would be the only thing I'd have my farrier look at. Um, I'm very big on X-raying feet. And the reason for that is that even the best farrier can't see inside a hoof. And I like to give my farrier everything to work with. So we always do a side on and front on X-ray of the feet so he can see the angles. And that way we can give the horse the best shoeing to um, support its body. Yeah. Um Talk to us about um, the horses that you've had success with. Otto Schumacher, a thoroughbred, didn't race. What was mm -hmm. uh, he like? And then um, with Zazi, talk to us about mm -hmm. her as well. So the similarities between the two of them, mm -hmm. Otto and Zazi, are that they um, were relentless. They were <laughs> very strong characters and both a little hot. He was a little bit less rational than she. Oh, she could be a little less rational as well um no so Otto I bought as a six-year-old and I found him in horse deals magazine a long long time ago and I went to try him and he had had a couple of eventing starts way back in the day when you know 105 pre-novice was the lowest class that you could do um and what I liked about him his owner was very honest with me and he said he's really spooky really spooky but he said he gives me one of the best feelings cross country I've ever had and he said, I can tell you because one day I was cantering him along at, you know, Wangaratta horse trials and Wangaratta has a lot of stone and they paint the stone white so you didn't stand on it. And he said, I was about jump five thinking how wonderful this horse was and next minute I was on the ground because it shot at the white stone. So that is exactly what Otto was like. But as a cross-country horse, he was incredibly brave and he had enormous scope, huge gallop and um, could shorten or lengthen. So um, he was a really amazing jumping horse for me. And he was the first horse that I took to four star to like advanced. Um, yeah. So that the quality that he had was that he was super brave and he would tow me down to a fence and I often didn't have enough control. 
Um, dressage wise, he was very fancy. He was bay with a big white face and two white socks and big boggly eyes. Um, so he had an enormous amount of presence, but we just had to keep a lid on it. But he could move very well. You know, had a great extended trot. You know, he was quite commanding in the in the ring. Um, and then show jumping, he's quite careful. It's quite a careful jumper. So he was quite an amazing find. Ultimate. But he was yeah. he was um, quite a handful. A lot of a handful, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, now he was sixteen two and a half, and I swear he grew to seventeen two <laughs> often. Like I. I swear he did. Um, yes. Now, Zazie, in comparison, I got as I think she was maybe an eight or nine year old, and she ah. had already been off the track and then produced by um, two friends of mine, Rob and Cassie Palm. And she was at two star <sighs> level of NT. Now, she's 15 3, um, yep. very petite, but she's by B and Coney. And as yes. far as I've, I, t I teach another uh, couple of clients with B and Coney's. And they have a really, really beautiful front, beautiful length of rain and neck. They move really well. Um, don't, don't, and yep. she is super careful and clever cross country. So she's really fast. She's really nippy. I could stop her on a shoestring. So for me, being five foot three, to ride a horse that I could gallop on a rubber snaffle and pull her up straight away, she never looked at a thing cross country. Like she was phenomenally easy. So cross country yeah. for her, I could easily run the time down, super brave, super honest, easy to turn, like delightful. And her dressage was only getting better and better. Like she was quite fancy. She had quite a fancy trot and great flying changes. So um, she was very sassy too. So if you gave her too much time off, she could be like quite sassy. Um, but as a competition horse, she was, um, yeah, she was in it as much as I was. Yeah. At what point do you find, um, you know, you, you, you get the horse off the track you kind of, you're moulding it how you want. At what point do you find that they've got that, that do or die attitude? Um, I think, um, you know, early, early enough on, early enough yeah. on. Yeah. So my big thing is that I like to, um, oh, there's a, there's another horse that I had called, he's called T.S. Jemimo. And he was by, is there a stallion called Urgent Request? Or was that his name? Anyway, I got him as a three-year-old and I wanted to see what he was like. So I was doing my lunging work with him and then I took him out to, I had some cross-country fences and I led him over a bit of a log and led him over a ditch and let him sniff a bank, which was about 90 centimetres, and he jumped up it. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's interesting. And then I, so I thought, all right, we turned him around. So do you want to jump off it? And he went, sure, and he jumped off it. And I tell you, from that day on, yeah. I knew that horse was going to be brave. So yeah. I think early on, I trot them over everything and give them a chance to look at water, at ditches, at banks, at plastic, at everything. And the ones that, um, you know, they're cautious and they look, but then they have a go. Yes. And I generally know that they're going to have an attitude like that. Yeah. 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 Now, preference for mares or geldings? Um, the lazy side of me wants to say geldings because <laughs> they are often less sassy however yeah. i have had some brilliant mares and zazi was definitely the best of them so i think a good mare can dig deeper than deep mm. yeah so you know just a good horse whatever yeah. either one mm. yeah now talk to us more about about zazi coco popping candy um you were mm -hmm. uh, reserved for the world equestrian games you were aiming mm -hmm. for tokyo uh very different in, in 2021 as opposed to a 2020 olympics it must yep. be heartbreaking to get a horse um, so far along, have such potential. Uh, but I guess uh, the silver lining, to some degree, you've got a mare you can you can bring mm -hmm. with her, potentially something down the track with her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess when I buy horses, I've never really bought them for a breeding prospect. And one of the things that I didn't want to do while she was a competition horse was embryo transfer or flush her because, mm -hmm. I don't know, I kind of figured that um, I wanted her to utilise her body best as a competition horse and not put it under any extra strain trying to, you know, have a foal. Um, yes. And so now that she has finished her career, um, We've still yet to do the tests um, and make sure that, you know, she is fit to have a foal, but we're looking forward to doing that. And, um, yeah, she, I suppose it's also quite difficult to find a high-performance mare who is a thoroughbred. Um, and the Warm Blood Societies have actually approached me to classify her as in, um, in one of the Warm Blood Societies as a broodmare, which is really yeah. interesting. 
Yeah, mm. wonderful. Um, in terms of other young horses you've got uh, coming along, perhaps this mm -hmm. rising seven-year-old, uh, we might see you out there competing on that if this friend of yours will, will give this horse up. Uh, what other <laughs> horses have you got uh, in the stables? Um, well, I'm actually having a bit of a, a, a reshuffle. So I've had five very good horses with some very supportive owners. And now we're, um, I'm looking to rebuild the team um, in a slightly different fashion. So as I mentioned before, I I've, I've, um, was always into eventing and I've decided that I want to take on some show jumping because one of the horses I've been riding has gone to World Cup. So um, I would like to add an offer tracker to the team. Um, so I think I'll, I'll be, you know, two to, two to four horses is enough for me um, because I ride them myself. I don't have lots of other people doing that for me. So I like the personal touch. Um, but I would really like to have, you know, that four, five, six-year-old off the tracker, 15-3 to 16-2. Um, I am I love a brown horse. Brown horses are very simple. They don't have to have socks or anything. A little white star no. will be enough. Um, enough. Yeah, low maintenance, no no mud fever, you know, very cool. Um, mare or gelding, as you said, if they're a mare, then, you know, if they're a good mare, then they have that option to be a brood mare. Um, but, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to to finding that next little thoroughbred superstar. Mm. Now, for people that might be um, watching the, uh, watching this interview, what words mm -hmm. of advice can you give to them? Might be somebody who's just starting out, somebody who's, who's coming from a pony to a thoroughbred. What's your sort mm -hmm. of your best advice? Oh, best advice. Um, I think that, well, in a way, I think that sometimes people give uh, thoroughbreds a bit of a bad rap and they go, no, don't want a thoroughbred, don't want a thoroughbred. Um, but personally, I think, I mean, obviously people are suited to different types of horses and I know some really, really quiet thoroughbreds and I know some really hot warm bloods. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's horses for courses. What I really like about getting a thoroughbred is particularly with the retraining program that you can now go to someone who's very experienced and will be able to um, assess the horse and tell you if it's, you know, what you're looking for. Um, I think that thoroughbreds don't forget they've loaded on trucks and floats, they've yeah. been hosed, they've been handled a lot, like they've been to the races. They've often done an awful lot compared to maybe young horses that, uh, you know, warm bloods that, that haven't done that. So I like that about the thoroughbred. Um, and I think it's really important to have a lot of good help. That's the thing is most important. Yeah. So to have somebody that is patient and understands that you're taking a horse from a racing stable and then training it in a different way and to give it the time and the patience and the know-how to embark on its new journey. Um, yeah, I think it's just getting getting really good help with people that have been there and done it before. Yeah, excellent. Well, Amanda, it's been fantastic chatting. I'm very excited for what the future uh, is ahead for you. I really, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for this uh, upcoming horse <laughs> that you potentially got. Uh, but it's been fantastic chatting. Um, no doubt we will cross paths in the future. But thanks so much for joining us on today's Masterclass. No, well, thank you for having me, Jeremy. It's been great fun. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, Tracy Robertson from Barris Talk Horse Feeds. Firstly, I want to say thank you for your support of today's masterclass and uh, for the masterclass choosing thoroughbreds off the track. Uh, it's fantastic and so great to see your partnership with Equal as well. So thank you. Absolute pleasure. It's a very passionate area for Barristock. They love both the off the track market and also Equal. Tony does some brilliant education um, seminars and also some really informative ones. So we're pleased to be a part of it. Uh, today was a great day. I got the opportunity to catch up with Russell Johnston, a very um, well-known uh, show jumper, competed in the 96 Atlanta Olympics, and Amanda Ross, who competed in the 2000 Olympics in the individual uh, three-day event. Fantastic competitors, fantastic and very down-to-earth people. They are both Barristock sponsored riders. Yeah, they do a fabulous job. They're, um, they're great with all the young riders. They encourage them, they support them. And then Russell Johnson has been um, well known for his off-the-track horses through Jump Off. And Amanda Ross has been riding Coco Popping Candy, which is an off-the-track horse, now Zazi, and who's now retired. But she's, um, she's also very passionate now about getting involved in more off-the-track horses. So we look forward to watching them both in the future. Isn't it fantastic as well to see that our thoroughbreds can get to compete on that uh, international level and at the very top? Horses that have had a racing career and they get the opportunity to have a life after racing. Yeah, you, you can't underestimate the thoroughbred. They're, um, they're smart, they're quick, they're sharp, they're talented and in the right hands I believe that they can do all the disciplines just as well as any other crossbreed horse. So yeah, definitely the off the trackers, they're, uh, they're a sneaky and a lot of people love them and rightly so. Yeah. Now, um, feeding horses for the racetrack is very different to their transitioning after life. 
Talk to me about what Barristock offers in terms of that uh, the feeding opportunities or the, or the feeds that are available for those horses that are transitioning. Well, Barristock feeds are very much about lifespan nutrition. So we feed horses on all levels from when they're born to weanlings to yearlings through their preparation and then onto the racetrack. So when they're racing, they have very high energy feeds. They have feeds that need to support their energy, their muscle development. And then when they come off the track, it's equally important to still have that nutritional profile for the horses, but we do it in a different way. So we've got a number of really good feeds that you can transition a horse off the track with. Um, Barristock Breed and Grow, Barristock Calm Performer, Barristock Low GI and Supreme, all, all feeds that will allow them to let down but still support their growing because a lot of thoroughbreds that come off the track are still quite young, so they're still developing, but not give them that extra energy to have them above themselves so that they can actually let down, become a horse, think about it and just slow down mentally and become you know, more handleable and then looking forward to the next stage in their education and career. Yeah, Tracy, for a lot of people that might have a horse at home, particularly off the track thoroughbred, how can Barristock support those people to find the right um, diet for their horses? If you go online to Barristock Horse, we actually have free diet analysis. So if you contact us, um, punch in all the details of your horse, tell us about its age, what it's been doing, when it was last racing, and its needs and what you hope to do with it, we'll be able to get our expert nutrition nutritionist to actually formulate a diet that suits you and lead you on the right direction and which feeds to buy that will be um, perfect for the next stage. Sounds ideal. Now to find out more about Barristock Horse Feeds, go to the website, socials as well, talk to us about what's available for people. Yeah, there. definitely. So go to Barristock, www.barristockhorse.com.au. We've also got a very active Facebook page, which is Barristock, uh, you can find on Barristock Horse. Uh, we've got a racing and breeding page too, if you want to see some of the horses, if you're interested in racing and you want to see them transitioning. Uh, and then also through Instagram as well. So um, definitely plenty of ways to contact us and stay in touch and we'd be more than willing to help you with any of your needs. Fantastic. Tracy, great chatting to you again on behalf of Equal and all the people out there. Thanks so much to Barristock for your wonderful support of today's masterclass and of all things Equal. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that's joining us. And yeah, good luck with your off the trackers. We look forward to seeing them out there. Look, the reset program, I can't, you know, talk about it enough because it, it just gives those horses another chance of life. We have been trying to find a home for a rocket mode for the past two years and the timing of this program has been wonderful because we were just about ready to give up hope. We've been shot down quite a few times by people. They just take one look at him and don't even want to give him a chance. There are lots and lots of thoroughbreds out there that are really amazing at lots and lots of different things and just gives them a chance to do something special and to be able to find their own person. I'm very excited to be part of the Reset program. It's something I feel strongly about, you know, making sure that thoroughbreds can go on and have a good home after they finish racing. Some of my best horses have been thoroughbreds off the track. Chatsfield probably would have found another amazing home had he not stayed here, but there was no way I was letting him go. I've lost count of the number of horses I've, I've helped find a home for and, and changed a lot of lives in doing so. It's not just the horses' lives, but it's the people's lives that get involved with these horses. That's the great thing about the Reset program. It really does show that these horses still have so much to offer in their post-racing careers.